sometimes stop being in touch with uh, people, then there's no point to be in touch. That's why I'm not. And uh, until that moment, I will try my best. <laughs> yeah. There's still very good music coming out of there. Yes, true. Sure. Sure. But, uh, yeah. Two and, a half, two and a half years after they decided they produced one success after the other. But, uh, yeah. well, no, but now, Whenever. Um, do, you want, ah. do you want to leave that monitor on? Because you'll, uh, you'll keep looking at it. That's no, 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 don't worry. It's okay. Really? Okay. Don't worry, I don't... If you look at it more than once, I'll turn it off. Sorry? I said, I'll, I'll make a bet if you look at it more than once, we'll turn it off. No, no, I don't look at it, it's finished. I look at you. But I have to... Mm. May, I, may I? Thank you. Okay, we'll leave it there. We'll put it there so smoke is right. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's a Ridley Scott trick. <laughs> haze. Well, it's not, not just the haze, he has another wonderful trick. Um, it's another wonderful vision trick that I've seen him do so many times. I mean, just watching the films. You have a scene, you and I are talking, and um, the, there's a, ca a ca couple of candles here. Just before he says, turn over. He blows the candle out and you have this little smoke wisping. Mm -hmm. No apparent reason, but it's just a yeah. wonderful effect. It sort of catches your eye. But in all his films, the, yeah, the, there's the, smoke the, everywhere. Not only, I mean, it's the way that he shoots this is very, very interesting. Very good. Yeah, I know. He's, I mean, he's a wonderful technician. A wonderful technician. Yeah. And then you can go and sit down, Felix. <laughs> don't, don't go far. Don't go far. No, I mean, the, the writing music for films, I mean, it just seems to me very... I can't believe, we talked about this before, I can't believe that, although I know it's true, that how quickly you wrote the music for, for example, for Blade Runner, and just seeing it, then, then away it went at your studio, which we're going to see. Well, I mean, quickly is not it was not so quickly. All, all, all depends, uh, you know, not only from the the let's say inspiration point of the composer, but uh, the the material itself. Because if uh, you know we keep changing the scenes, and we have to re, re adapt the music, that can take for ages. I mean, that's the Alexander, for example, Alexander example, which took one and a half years. I normally feel it can be done in one month, two months, three months, if you want. But uh, all depends. You can, you can say it's the amount of music, the compatibility with the director, many, many factors. But it's better to go uh, as fast as possible. You know, stays fresh. <laughs> but I mean, I've seen you. I've seen you myself. I mean, I've seen you in, the, in your studio. Mm. Uh, compose at, at extraordinary speed, um, and that's not with any images in front of you to inspire you. I mean, that uh, that does seem to be amazing that you just sit at this desk and suddenly a whole symphony concert, a symphony appears. In fact, yeah. So, what do you want to say about that? Nothing. I mean, I'm, it's, I'm not asking you a question. Oh, no, 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 yeah. Um, I just, I, yeah. I do find the whole process of uh, almost, if I say almost magical, I mean, if there is a kind of element of, of, um, of inspiration, yeah. of, of um, improvisation, of. Um, 
suddenness about it. Yeah. Well, it's it's. Uh, I always ask myself this question about speed. What is fast and what is slow? And uh, it's everything is relevant. And one uh, seems to me fast, maybe from from the for the microcosm could be very very slow. And the contrary. And uh, what is I think what is important to me actually is not to uh, wait and to spend time from the moment of the let's call it inspiration or the signal signal and to the the point that you put that down mm-hmm. and uh, because it, the shorter is the distance between these points, I think the most uh, uh, objective you can be. If, uh, if you let the, the time and you, you let the thought take place and you start thinking and try to change it and uh, try to put your, your um, how you call it, your point of view, uh, th- then maybe you might end up with a result which is not as good as the the immediate one. I always try to let the music first, to let the music speak. I don't want to interfere. Human interference always is second best. And. Uh, as music, it's before ourselves, and uh, it's better to follow the message. Music knows exactly what to do, as long as we let music uh, be. Yeah. This is going to be very deep philosophically. Well, that's good. No, no, it's it's no, it's, it's more scientific than philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I just try to explain the function. I mean, how how human being functions. I mean, uh, uh, music is not our property. It's a way to to express things, and it's a code, and it's uh, what uh, makes the the universe move, shapes the universe. So, I don't think we can do better. I mean, we, a matter of speech, you can say, ah, yes, I have an idea, or I just I imagine that, or, or I have an inspiration, but all that are words. I think the, the word more accurate is to be available. And when you're available, uh, like a radar, then the message comes. And then you have it. Now, Technologically, it's how to have it, because you can have it in your mind, but how are you going to put it, how are you going to make it uh, real, I mean, in order to hear it? And uh, that's why I, I try to develop this, this system, which actually gives me the opportunity, and with a lot of practice through the years, to, to shorten this distance and to be able to... Uh, to cover the, the the complete area of musical spectrum instantly, in order not to 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 give to give the the excuse or, or the room to myself to think if it's good or not, because I don't know, I don't want to know. That's why most of my compositions. And when I say my compositions, I don't like the word my compositions, but anyway. Um, the, uh, I, I hear them uh, maybe six months later. I don't hear what I'm doing immediately, except, of course, films. That's, that's a different thing. But talking in general about music, it's better not to hear what you're doing. So when you, do it, when you hear it with a distance, it's like you hear for the, something for the first time, and then you know is if the the, the the 
the given moment if if is a is a good moment it was a good moment or not if it functions you can see it immediately you can feel it so it's a completely different approach to music which started from the day one I mean since I start to understand the world about with music actually this is how I understand the world I didn't mean to get quite so uh, philosophical quite so quickly again <laughs> again it's, it's scientific <laughs> scientific <laughs> scientific <laughs> yeah well, I mean, so just <coughs> what, 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 what then do you think is the function of music does it have a function it has I mean the music has the function it doesn't have functions, it's the function. Take the music out of the universe, no universe. All our uh, um, details after that, all our, um, how you call it, um, all happens because of music. But then again, we have to go through the word music, we have to go through the meaning of today, what what meant or what what means, uh, and uh, you know, since uh, humans being uh, human being makes uh, made music uh, his own property, uh, then treated music in a completely different way. Sometimes through that. Few composers they made wonders, and uh, you know, timeless things. But all those things are fractions because the, the most, the most of the music, it's it's rubbish. In every uh, in every um, field field of music, even classical music, you have some fantastic things, but some things are unbearable. No, I suppose. I mean, this is going to sound very uh, trite, and I wish it to sound trite, but here we are in Greece, not a million miles from the Parthenon. And you could say that that's exactly what the Greeks understood music as, as something which expressed the universe in which they lived. And however primitive that music was. It was not, I mean... Is that, is that a fair, do you think? You know, Greeks... Uh my ancestors, they, they had a very, very mathematical mind. And they try to, that's why, I mean, they're timeless. They, they try to always, when they said something, to prove it. And to have um, a sense, which is actually uh, a scientific sense. So science, it's... Uh, it's uh, uh, as much as Object, objective you can be. And uh, through that uh, way of thinking and feeling the whole thing, they find out that uh, they knew actually that music is the first thing in the world which shapes and makes move the world and give, it's completely tied to mathematics, but music gives life to mathematics. Without music, it's no life. All that maybe sounds a little bit crazy, but today, but they're not. And you see more and more and more and more. Uh, even scientists that try, they, they, they start to understand that in every field. And you can, you can really learn uh, the universe through music, because music is the code. But today, when you say music, immediately your mind goes through, through a piece of music, through a singer, uh, through uh, an opera, through anything. And all that, I mean, these are the results of, of branches, little things of music, but not really music itself, which is the whole thing. I mean, you can talk music before sound. Before sound is music. And uh, if you go to even to Pythagoreans and all that, which actually they, they find and they work with a monochord, mm -hmm. which we don't have to go through that now. With one only string, you can define everything and you can have the, you can define the, as we say, the logos be, between. Now we have to answer to technology. 
and I won't answer to technology. Πάει και αυτό, να μην χτυπάει το τοκ μέσα. Δεν μπορώ να το πετάξω τώρα. Όχι, Λόρα, μου δεν το πετάω. Έλα. Τα Deep subjects. I'm sure we'll come back to that. I mean, I asked you what what you thought the function of music was. Um, it's okay. Um, what, what the function of music? Well, was I, I gonna... no. I was going to say. I think that I think that the, the, the trouble is that when we say, as you quite rightly pointed mm. out, when we say music, there's all these different sounds coming at us, absolutely non-stop. The ringing of the phone, um, you know the. Yeah, that sounds. Of yeah. course, that's yeah. what I meant. So, I mean, yeah. as you quite rightly said, music has a much deeper and more profound, more universal yeah. harmony of the spheres, if you like, doesn't it? I mean, there's something really. It's, it's the, the creator, the creation. But, but you know, the, the function could be, uh, could be fantastic or could be, uh, you know, uh, catastrophical. And I, I'm afraid that today we're going that way. We're using this incredible divine uh, uh, thing we call music, which is the most powerful thing today, and that's why, because it's powerful, it became so so popular as a, as a as a as a as a you know mean of, of of communication, and it's been used from the media to uh, influence and change things around, and through music you. You can market anything you want. You know that very well. So, uh, music uh, can be therapeutic and can can be really a deadly weapon. You can't control things with music. Why we use music to everything? Why we need music? Why everybody, you know, uh, uh, speak the language of music? The globe. I mean, forget the the universe. Just the earth. Why? I mean, you don't speak Chinese, you don't speak maybe another language, you don't speak Greek, maybe, but you, you speak music. Why we do that? Why we know? Why we whistle? Why we do la 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 la, even, you know, when we're two or three years old? Why I started with music four years old? Who taught me this? So because it's implanted on us, in everybody. So that's why when people say, I, I know nothing about music, they mean that I've never been to school, I never learned notes, which I never did myself. And I still don't. But uh, you can't say that you don't know about music because music made you. Music is the strongest thing. It's as strong as oxygen. And it speaks directly to your soul. Directly. That's why it's important. That's why it's not philosophical, it's scientific. And you see more and more when we're going to, after all those centuries of hibernation we, that, that um, humanity went through, start even through technology today, they start slowly to understand things that the, our ancestors understood thousands of years before. And that's why we have to be very, very careful. I always said it, the usage, how we use music which uh, apparently it's a very, uh, you know, harmless thing, but it's not, it's not. And more and more and more there are the studies and uh, articles about 
the danger of music and all this. And I, I don't want to go through that and what they do on the internet. And then even they get drugged with music now. It's a new drug. I mean, it's, it's, but that's a different thing. You can really do a lot of things with, uh, with sound. Well, of course, I mean, the perfect example of that uh, is the use of music in ads. I mean, mm -hmm. the music of an ad makes yeah. the ad memorable. Uh, yeah. frequently. I mean, yes, it could look great. Mm. I mean, Ridley's ads always look wonderful, but what you remember is the sound. Yeah. Frequently what you remember is the sound. And, for example, I mean, I always have to think, was it a fiat or whatever it was, that wonderful arrangement? Mm. What I remember is the music. Mm. It was the music that, um, maybe because that's what I'm interested in, but it was the music that hit me first, and then I could I could tell you the music before I could tell you the name of the car I'm watching. If you see what I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. So also, it's also, it's another thing that a piece of music, uh, if you like it, you can hear it as many times as you want for years. How many times you can see the same image, the same film, ten, twenty, thirty, and then you get tired. It's nothing wrong with the film, but the music doesn't have. It's a, it's a abstract. It's immaterial. And uh, and then it works in a completely different way. It's the most accurate, actually, because an image is not accurate. An image you can make an image, you can fool some someone with an image, but with music you can't because you hear what you hear. If you say the you take a note, any note you want, this note will be the same everywhere, it will never change. But if you take an object. You take an apple, whatever, and you film it that way, it's different, but it's like this, this way is different. The note is the same. Paradoxically, of course, I mean, I'm now thinking of the, the opening images of Blade Runner. I mean, paradoxically, mm. um, I see that image when I listen to your music. If I just listen to your music, mm. uh, the, you know, the great opening yeah. of going up the thing, I know immediately that image, I know what that film is about, even though I haven't seen seen the film before, mm. I know what the story is, I know what the atmosphere mm. is, yeah. I know, in, a, in a strange kind of way, and it's not a word I use loosely, I know what the message is of the film, if you see what I mean, the message is very, very complicated, but the music is complicated, but paradoxically, the, the sound is giving me a much more multi-dimensional image than just the image on its own, mm. do you see what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I do tribute to you and what you did, but... Well, I, I don't know, but... No, but well, I don't expect you to, to say that, but the, but the fact is that you can often, with a sound, give me a much more um, resonant image, if that's not mixing up the metaphors, than just the picture. But if what, you, what, I mean. okay, if what you say, it's, it's so. Uh, it's... Um, and if, if that happens... Maybe it's because the, the first time that I saw this shot, this shot, I just reacted like that. This is what I was saying before. Yeah. That I'm not sitting down and say, okay, what am I going to do with this? And try to be, um, to underline something. But it's the first, of course I can underline it. We all do. I do it as well if I want. But I try not to. And I try to be it's, it's, as much as instinctive as possible. I mean, when I see something, immediately to react. And my first reaction, I put it down on tape and this is it. And maybe that's why, maybe I say, I don't know, maybe that's why you have this reaction. Uh, because I had this reaction. It was real to me. So if it's real, uh, as, as, as fast as possible, it's much, much probable to be real to you. I mean, all the contrary it can be real to me and it's, it's not, it can't not be real to you but I mean uh, I don't know if it works it's maybe because I say maybe maybe because of this because my it, always I react and I always the uh, let's say the 90 90% 90 of the cases uh, everything that you hear uh, that I wrote for 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 soundtrack for movies it's the first take, is that just the first reaction? That's all, the first take, and that's it. And because, uh, because I'm, I'm able to, to uh, 
most of the times to, to give the complete sound spectrum. The take is this, and that's it. You don't have to go through the process of rearranging and doing things like that. It's that fresh, like that. Either you, you, you got it or you don't. You didn't. It's <laughs> simple as that. You, you, you threw away a moment ago the line that uh, when you were four, you started to... Well, as long as, long as I remember. As long as you remember. I, but I, I don't know whether you said you began to hear sounds. I, I'm not quite sure what you said at that point. No, I said, I said that uh, from the early ages, uh, since I remember myself, I always understood the world around me through sound. Not through images, all the all these objects at home. I mean, like uh, like any child, uh, I had to to hit them and to to get the sound, if they had the sound. For example, uh, from the wood sound to metal sound to glass sound, and then to objects. And then from this sound, I knew the soul of the. Of the um, of the of, of the object itself, because this is how we know things. I mean, like like when you see a human being, you see a human being, and then, but it's something else that you see that you you know him or you don't. It's another language, and this language is to me sound, and each object has its own uh, sound, its own music inside. is built with it. So this, until today, I do that. I can't understand the, the world without sound, without through, through the sound. I'm going to, I know you don't want to talk about it, and I won't talk about it very much, but the fact is that you have made, I, I hesitate, I don't know what word to use anymore, created, discovered, <laughs> um, heard, um, some wonderfully constructed commercial records, I mean, songs. Yeah. Um, and of course, but among other things, talking about Aphrodite's Child, and also the stuff you did with, with John Anderson. Mm. Now, that suggests, in spite of what you're saying, enormous uh, discipline, because it's not easy to construct something that is three or four minutes long, mm. is instantly memorable. Uh, and uh, is um, a commercial success. Yeah. If you see what I mean. Yeah. Now, I'm not quite sure how you put those two together, and is that the reason why, in the end, Aphrodite's Child was unsatisfactory, because it wasn't allowing you to explore a more wider spectrum? Do you see what I mean? Okay, l let's, let's take it from the beginning, just to understand, because, I mean, Sometimes it will sound a little bit schizophrenic, the whole thing. No, no, no. No, no. Yeah. no the thing is that the way that I grow up, the, the way that I grow up, and the way that I, as I said before, I understood the world, and my first uh, uh, encounter with music, the, the first, you know, memories uh, with music, uh, always they've been different. Uh, imagine that I never grew up with the, uh, uh, with the idea to become famous or to become a professional musician or to become a composer. I mean, all those things, they didn't have anything. I mean, no meaning to me. But they still don't have now. But through the years, uh, I had to do certain things in order to to get somewhere and to have the facilities to do some more. Because uh, when you grow up as, as a concert pianist or a singer or, uh, you know, a rock and roll guitarist or something like that, you don't need much. But if you go through uh, the, the, you know, the, the direction and the way that I'm doing things today, you need a lot of technology, you need your own studio, you need a lot of things. So in order to obtain and to do all that, I had to, to go through this um, uh, music industry, which is, it was not the best thing for me. And I had to play the game. And to go through this uh, music industry, and to be, you had to be successful. You have to be successful. You have to sell records. You have to, because this is the only thing they were, I mean, 
they, this is what they, they're looking for. I mean, they're looking sales. Uh, and they're looking to have people to be able to sell and to be successful and to become stars, whatever stars they are. And that was a very difficult thing for me all my life because I never play the game. Uh, I play maybe a 10, 20%, but not 100% of the game, which is a, not a very good thing for this game itself. Then, and maybe, uh, fortunately or, or unfortunately, uh, maybe I had a facility to write uh, uh, things that uh, uh, we call it uh, hits. And these hits maybe gave me the opportunity, in one hand, uh, to, uh, to get the, the you know, the, the, the technology and the materials and the studios I needed to build all those things. But on the other hand, the, um, it's been my, my biggest obstacle because I couldn't create and I, and I couldn't do the things I wanted to do since my childhood. i never been, I never been a good <laughs> a pop star. i never been, you know, the... Uh, the type of, of the, the Vangelis that they try to sell the record companies. I always, that be, has been always my biggest problem. Uh, I was promoted in a different way from the, the, from the one I am, really. Not because I'm not the other one, because I was doing it. But I was doing it not because that was my you know, my primary decision is because I had to do it. Otherwise, I couldn't. I couldn't, how, I mean, through this, the electronic uh, field, I couldn't uh, buy, I mean, all the synthesizers, and I couldn't, you know, equip my studio with the latest technology, and I keep doing it until now, which is, I mean, a big thing. So I had to, had to fa fund the funds, the funding, which I always did myself, in order to create all those kind of things. And then that deprived me of, of another big, big, uh, very important uh, thing, which is the to create out, out of that, or maybe to do other things. And then you know something else, that uh, when you work in that field, and if you have the the chance or the misfortune to be successful, then you have to repeat yourself. This is another thing that I was trying not to do. And that, that's, that's why, you know, in record companies, they always said I'm very difficult and I'm, you know, and all that stories, I mean, I'm not difficult, but, but I could never follow, uh, you know, this prog product uh, kind of destiny to do. <laughs> to repeat myself and to be, you know, uh, a soft drink or a hard drink or, you know, a chocolate cake or something like that, the same, you know, a fast food or whatever, you know, to repeat doing exactly the same thing, but I had to do it. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes I still do it, but I mean, I, I, I can't say I'm very happy. But again, maybe what, what pushed the people to do that is because, uh, since day one, I create uh, some quite big hits. So, so that was really the good and the bad thing. So really what you're telling me was, is that, since we're um, talking about Aphrodite's child, that that was something which you felt you had to do, but it was not something which fulfilled you in any real creative sense? Or no, because it was a fraction, and the fraction became my whole life. Imagine that today, if, I, if I, I'm going to give a concert anywhere in the world, what people they expect to hear from me? Child Sophia, 4092, some Johnny Evangelis, some, you know, maybe, I don't know, Albedo, Alpha, you know, China, or, you know, things albums that they bought. But that time when I was doing those things, I was doing other things which are completely unknown. And if I go, if I give a concert by playing maybe my latest symphony, 
that will be a disaster. Nobody will want to know about it. So here you have uh, someone that you know he, he is doing things every day, but unfortunately, because of of this successful, let's call it career, people are stuck to this. So then you have when you do concerts, you must have the this relation. Otherwise, no point. Could be a, a dramatic situation, really. And uh, you know, now if I go on stage as a product, as a successful Vangelis, then I have to play, you know, all those kind of things, and then it will be a great concert, and everybody will love it, and there's nothing, nothing wrong about it. I'm not against that, but I will, I will never have the same enjoyment to go on stage and to play something instant, something that happened now. It will be much more, you know, satisfactory for me. And maybe for the people, but the people, they're not prepared for that. I must say, every time I've seen you play in concert or in film, or sometimes in the, in the play, you never, look, you never look happy when you suddenly come onto the stage, as if this is something, as you've said, which is a part of what is expected of you. It's part of the product, as it were. Um, but you never look as if you're, because you're going to play Jarrett Safari or whatever it is, but you never look as if um, this is something which you are looking forward to doing. But it's another thing that no, conscious and never, and uh, never as uh, how you call it, um, spontaneous. Exactly, uh, they're not spontaneous. They should be. A concert should be a spontaneous thing. Now, another example: if if I decide to give a concert tomorrow, this is out of the question. The only way to do that is to go in the street and play immediately with a small kind of, you know synthesizer thing, or a piano, or something, or a guitar. But if I want to do it properly with all my equipment, it's impossible. First of all, technologically, it's impossible to do it in one day. And second, if you want to, do a pro to give a proper concert, you have to go through, uh, through um, an agent. You have to, to find dates, the theaters are booked in two or three years, or six months, or whatever they are booked. And then they will give you a date which actually, they must find the date, and then they have to match the date with, with a product. Do you have a new album out, or you don't? Uh, it's an event there, or there's something happened in your life in, in order to give the concert, yes or no? All those things, they, 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 they start to complicate the whole thing. It's not um, spontaneous anymore. And then by the time, the, let's, let's say that I say yes, and a year later, as the, 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 this, <laughs> this date approaches. I don't feel that way. <laughs> so I don't think I will, be, I will be fair to the public to go there because I signed a contract to do it. Because somehow, I think you must, we have to be um, honest with ourselves and with, with the audience. And I think that this, in this, let's call it business, because this, this is how they call it, uh, it's very difficult because I don't think people they are very very happy. Although if you are so much egocentric that you have to be on stage all the time and to be applauded, then you don't care whatever happens. Or maybe you want to make so much money, then then you you tour and you know you you, you make you give maybe hundred and fifty concerts a year, so you can make a lot of money. Then you don't care about the rest, about all those kind of things I say. But if you, if you imagine all these people that tour around, I don't think they're happy people. No matter what happens on stage, then they laugh and they, you know, they jump and you know, they give a lot of energy and all that. It's a, I think it's, it's a game which is, it doesn't contain too much honesty. Okay. It's fascinating. We're in 10 minutes we start the farting, don't worry. Yeah, it's fascinating. It is, it is good. But it's a serious subject. It's a serious subject. It's a serious subject. It's a serious subject. 
Are you are you varying it a little? Are you staying are you staying at that angle? Are you varying a little? No. You're just staying exactly the same because I can change it digitally. Well, I can say exactly the same things from that time. No, 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 no. no, no. What I meant is, uh, it's, uh, we we've discovered now with the new wonder digital that we'll fix the shop. I can do that. I can't do that. I can't make it what it wasn't, but I can change it. Um, yeah, I, yeah. This is how how wide you go, like the like we have here. Like this one, eh? Okay. I I think that that type of conversation doesn't need a lot. It needs here because what else? I mean, yeah, yeah. maybe there are other moments we can do other things when I start dancing and all that. Yeah, exactly. But but for the moment, yeah. yes. Yeah. Now, I was going to say, we, we're getting dangerously close to, and it's leaping ahead to, uh, to... I don't want to make it personal at all about Peter Gale, but I mean, it's getting dangerous to Sony Classics and Methodia, mm. which was a kind of commercial event, which is why one sensed all the time that this was, this was something which had been a wonderful idea, but now was being straight-jacketed almost into into promotion, if you see what I mean. And I remember the hordes of journalists who were flown in from all over the world. I also remember um, everybody wanting to do the interview for the record company. Mm -hmm. And finally there was that press conference which I was at, which I must, you looked incredibly unhappy at that, I must mm -hmm. say, and, and uh, justifiably so, because it wasn't, that didn't have anything to do with the uh, wonderful thing which you'd created, which was now being packaged like a block of cheese almost. You see what I mean? Mm. I mean, that's in, in almost the perfect example of, of, the, of being torn into something that you didn't, that you reluctantly accepted, but it was, the reluctance was large. I think the sad... I'm not wishing to make it personal about, about Methodia or Sony Classics mm. at all. No, 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 but, but it's one thing then again that it's a little bit out of, out of place, is that the reason that at the, at the time that I signed with uh, Sony Classics, uh, it's uh, the main main reason is because I thought I was under the impression at the time that I was given the opportunity to open to the fields that actually I, I couldn't before due to the record companies, and for the first time, even even the the the, the name Sony Classics immediately it gives you another. Another perspective, mm -hmm. but that was wrong because it's it's. I think that was just a name, and the record company uh, behaved exactly the same way. If they sell, uh, you know, hip hop, or if they sell classic, or if they sell, uh, you know, tango or Latin or rock and roll or whatever or crossover or everything you want, uh, it w it's, it's just, it was just a name. And uh, although, although we spend a lot of effort and money and all that to do this, and everybody agreed, and you know, you, you remember about what happened with with Methodia. In the end, I think that the record company uh, they never believe that this record is commercial to their standards, and I don't think they will ever believe that. But, <laughs> but. Um, it's been, I think it's been buried from the, from the record company. And when I say that, I'm, 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 the, I'm in a very bad position to say that because I'm the composer, I'm the artist, as they say. And of course the artist also will blame the record company, as usual. I have the experience and a lot of other successes in my life not to say that. And I know what I'm saying. And I can judge if the record company does uh, you know, the right thing or the wrong thing. And uh, I didn't expect Methodia to become, uh, you know, a number one record because of his its uh, content. Mm -hmm. But I never ex expect the company to drop it either after all this effort. And this is the truth. Uh, irrespective if people they like it, if irrespective if a lot of young children, children they like it. Yeah, I mean, I think that 
the way that um, I explain things now, if I was a record company man, not, not, the, not the artist. Because uh, what I can say, I can say that record companies, they lost it anyway, bit by bit, and they panic and they don't know what to do and, and all that, and they can mess up and they can bury their own, their own product and, you know, I, I really don't know. But it's just, just a very strange game, all that thing. It's nothing to do with music. But the good thing was that uh, I mean, working with the, those great singers. Yeah. Talk a little about that. What do you remember of that? Well, you know, uh, for works, for music like Methodia or symphonic things like that, when you use singers, it, you know, it's good to have singers which the the, um, the, the, the the texture of the voice match when they sing together and this is this was the case of Catherine and, and Jesse marvelous marvelous singers marvelous but both together they create another marvelous thing and uh, I think from what they say that they enjoyed it very, very much. And that's very, very important because it's good when you work with people to enjoy what you give them, to them. Take, take me back to another, another great event, um, which was the, and um, you can sketch in as much of the background as you want, but the World Games, I mean, that was your, in every sense, your baby, wasn't it? I mean staging it in that great stadium, putting up the false um, um, arches at one end, the mm -hmm. lighting, which is amazing, um, the drums, the, the dancers. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I, I mean, how, how long did it take you? I mean, it's an extraordinary. When you look at it, the finished tape. It didn't take long. I was, I was really brought to this thing. I didn't want to do it at the beginning. And then I've been asked from from the ministry, Minister of Athletism, I mean, Culture, you know, the same ministry, to, uh, to create this kind of thing. And uh, somehow, I, you, know, you know, I just felt that after all, you know, maybe I have to do it, and I did it. And uh, by the time we've been proposed that, well, that was around Christmas that year, uh, it was not an easy thing. And we started working two months before August. That was 1st of August, 1997. So I had two months to prepare all those things and to build all those things. And it was really very, 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 extremely difficult, difficult uh, situation. And... Uh, Wasn't there some opposition to you putting the, the, the arches up at one end? Oh, oh I had, uh, had uh, you know, I've been through hysterical times. I mean, you know, through a lot of um, problems and uh, obstacles and political things and that was really really a, a battle more than anything else and uh, the fact that Indiana was it was you know so successful you know made the difference but I mean you know I don't think it's something that anybody wants to go a second time but you almost did with the Olympic Games. I mean, that was also, as I understand it, a political infighting as well. Yes. Again, all that is because, I mean, going through this, we we're going to open another, another Pandora's box. And uh, first of all, I believe that we, we lost the Olympic Games. We don't have Olympic Games anymore. Real Olympic Games. We have something else, 
that we call it Olympic Games, but it's not what I believe. And what I, I think and what, what, what the Olympic Games uh, meant to be. So, with this, with this, this uh, within this uh, new concept, uh, I can't say anything, or I have to say a lot of things, because uh, I don't think that that I I, I would like any more to do. I, I mean, I don't I don't think that uh, I would like to have anything to do with the Olympic Games anymore. Yeah, okay, now tell me tell me what you mean by that. Because it's a commercial operation, and because I believe that that the, the only the only point of reference it's left to to humanity today, the gathering together every four years in a peaceful in brackets in peaceful way is the Olympic Games, and. Uh, it's maybe a, a, an opportunity every four years for every company and every, you know, people that they, they build there or whatever, to make fortunes and to push the Olympic Games artists, like you know, the athletes, like, like the, uh, the record companies with the artists, now it's the, <laughs> to push them to, you know, to, to advertise their products. That's all it is, nothing else. And then, of course, it's a big discussion because this is a big problem about uh, doping and all that. But it's, it, it, all this, is, it's, it was meant to be. How you expect today the athletes not to, to get drugs, the moment that the whole philosophy is to not only to get first, but to break the record and to advertise, you know, products like shoes, like whatever, of record, of, of record. Please <laughs> do. Of, yeah, I mean, you know. So, it's, it's big money behind. It's big money. So it's nothing to do. I mean, sometimes, I, I'm not against money, we all need money, but there are some moments that we have to, to just to, to, to function without this, this money uh, need or philosophy. Because we need points of reference. We need standards, we need something in order to be able to do all the, you know, all the, you know maybe the negative, the bad, or the silly things, and then sometimes they say, okay, stop now. We're fasting. We do money fasting for 15 days or for more. And, and we, we continue again. Because, I mean, I don't... <laughs> I, I, I can't say more than that. I mean, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I mean, for me, it's a joke, the whole thing. How how they started and how this thing these things became. Well, uh, let, let's take two examples. Um, uh, the Great Olympic Hymn. I'm going to refer to that. Whatever mm. you think of it, I think it's a wonderful hymn. Is that what you were trying to express in, at that moment? With this sense of people coming together and some sort of celebration of of humanity. First of all, when you we say Olympic Games, already we're wrong. Because the, the Olympic is right, game is wrong. It's, they're not games. In Greece we apply another word, which we, we don't, I can't find it in the English dictionary. The, the word agon doesn't, doesn't exist. So, already by, by, by name Olympic Games, the event, Games are games for also, you know, the gladiator games or any game. It's not the same thing. It's not the same purpose. It's not the same behavior. It's not the same ideal. Although every time, you know, when the beginning, it's the president and the other president, this, the, the, you know, all presidents around, and they, and, and, and they talk about these ideals and da-da-da-da-da-da, and all this bullshit. And it's nothing to do with that. And, uh, you know, maybe 
when I I just try a little bit to uh, to do something, maybe I was trying to to bring a, a different point of view. I mean, ridiculous! What different point of view? You can't do that, and uh, to something that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, today we talk always about the the opening ceremony of every Olympic game, every country. To me, even if you have the best, uh, the best show in the world, is a show. And I don't believe that we need that for the Olympic Games. We, need, we can do that for other things. We can create great shows. But the Olympic Games is not a cabaret. It's something different. Now, if we understand the difference, and we understand the dangers, and what, where we're leading the whole thing from the spectacle point of view, and from the, uh, the um, ath athletic point of view, how we lead the things in order to satisfy other needs, then, if we don't understand that, then it's going to be, we're going to destroy everything. And we, I think we already did. Because today we talk about things that are completely irrelevant. Uh, as we said before, we said, do you like the opening ceremony of China, of, uh, you know, of Greece, of, uh, how you call it, uh, Australia, all that? I can say yes or no. But this yes or no doesn't have anything to do with the Olympic Games. I can, I can judge as, as, as a show, but completely outside of, the, of what the Olympic Games need. So that's why I think that I'm so uh, totally a part of that, that I'm not maybe the right person to, to be asked this question. <laughs> Although, although I've been through, and I have to say something, that how I can say that the moment that I create this, this uh, 97 ceremony? But this 97 ceremony was not the Olympic Games. As simple as that. Because for the Olympic Games, I would never do that. I would never have done that. What, what, gave, you the, what gave you the idea for the uh, Greek section then of uh, Sydney? The idea? Yeah. What do you mean, the idea? Well, describe it to me, because we're going to be, we will see it. I think. You see that again. This uh, weak point is that when when uh, they ask me something official from the government, I mean, my country say, "Can you help us? Can you do that?" It's very dif difficult for me to say no. Although I did say no many times, but. You know, and they came and said, "Okay, uh, we have a ritual every every four years. The country that takes the Olympics to to go to to the the, the country that already holds the Olympics and to perform 10, 12, 12 minutes of something, get the Olympic flag and and bring it back to the." to their own country. That, that is the ritual every four years. And they ask me if I can help them, I can do something about it. I know that uh, in every case, this, uh, these 10 minutes are really useless because nobody <laughs> pays attention to that. <laughs> the games are finished, games of course. They <laughs> They're mostly, you know, drunk or, you know, they don't give a damn. They got the medals, the gold and silvers and all that, and, you know, and, and you know, it's a big uh, wow thing, you know. And, uh, and that, to me, it was a big challenge because I said, okay, uh, if I say yes, yes, okay, I can say yes, but then what am I going to do? Because I didn't want to go there as, I mean, to to represent my country and I feel completely, you know, ridiculous, right? If nobody pays attention, why going there, right? 
and going through the trouble. Someone wanted to go to play Chariots of Fire. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that would have been the, the easiest, incredible yeah. idea. Everybody would have said, oh, yes, play Chariots of Fire. That was not the case. And my big, big problem was how to, to make a stadium which actually, you know, is going through, through hell. <laughs> How, for 10 minutes, to, to stop them shouting and just focus to the 12 minutes of Greece or whatever country it would have been, you know. Then I had the idea, because, you know, every, as, as you know, every time for the Olympic Games, we have the priestesses of Apollo that they, you know, in Olympia, they take the flame from the sun and they, they send the flame to, to each country. And um, I said that, you know, we are the only ones that we have this, so why not use it? So are the priestesses that they're going to, you know, to take the, the flag? Is that it's the first time in the Olympic history that happened, that never happened before? Because no other country has this. Only Greece has that, you know. So I said that the moment that we have this, why not use it and why not, you know, organize it like this? So I, I built the, uh, the same stage here in Greece, same stage that they, they built, they had there in, the, in Sydney. And uh, with the priestesses and with special music, I just put together this 12 minutes with the changing of the flag, you know, with, a, uh, with a, the mayors, the two mayors, the mayor of Athens and the mayor of Sydney. And uh, I said, that's it, no more. The most simple thing, you have the priestesses working in the stadium, the, you know, the mayor brings the flag, they take the flag and they go. You can't do it more simple than that. And I said to myself that, you know, with the priestess and the music, are they, you know, we're going to, they're going to throw, you know, tomatoes and oranges and whatever <laughs> objects, or they, you know, they stop shouting. And um, that day I sat on television, it was a, you know, uh, I didn't go to, the, to, to Australia and uh, watched to see what's happening, if it's going to be a disaster or not. <laughs> That was very hard for them, actually, because, you know, you have all these, you know, young girls in the middle of 100,000 people shouting like crazy. And then you have the music starting and then they start, you know, walking and very, very slow against <laughs> the whole, you say in English, pandemonium? Yeah. Okay. And then... Uh, Suddenly, quiet, the whole stadium. And then as they went up the stairs and they did all they had to do, some, you know, some dancing, you know, ceremonial thing. They pay tribute to the flag, they throw some leaves and some olive things and laurel things to, to the flag. They took the flag and they left the stadium for 10 minutes. You know, whatever, you know, was the, the whole thing. Nothing. Incredible. And I had, you know, the mayor of Athens with tears, actually, because he couldn't believe it. And, you know, that's it. it sometimes it happens. <laughs> Film directors are, as you know, uh, a strange bunch of people. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm being polite. Uh, I include myself. <laughs> 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 They all have different ways of working. Now, yeah. You're sitting there with a film that somebody has believed in for, they will tell you, for 50 years. They've raised $100 million or whatever, yeah. some ridiculous sum of money. It's finally all come down to this piece of celluloid. Nine times out of ten, and I know this, uh, I remember talking to Olivier about um, Henry V. Yeah. He always believed that it was the music that Walton provided him with, William Walton provided mm -hmm. him with, that saved the film. I mean, that's not true. But the music often gives something 
gives an extra dimension. I mean, think of Bernard Herrmann and Hitchcock. Mm. Um, not including you, because that's obvious. But uh, the directors at, at that point are a pretty nervy bunch because they've spent the money, they've got the celluloid, they don't know. I mean, talking to Ridley about uh, Blade Runner, I mean, they never knew, they never ever, and it wasn't, of course, a, a commercial success at the beginning, but they never knew, if now, I'm talking about the film as opposed to the soundtrack, but they never knew, the directors at that point don't know what's going to happen to their baby. I know. It's either going yes, to be sir. off that night and it's going to open and close the same day. It must be a very tense and difficult moment. I mean, how do they, the ones, the, the many great directors that you've worked with, I mean, I know it's impossible to characterize them all as a group, but I mean, it must be, it must be a difficult moment. Maybe one of the reasons is difficult because it comes to the end. In music, it's uh, you know it's when everybody's tired and uh, pe almost penniless because they can't spend any more. They are maybe three or four times over budget, and here we come with the music. Now there are many many difficult things. First of all, the composer itself. It's not a matter if he's a good or bad composer. It's if he his decision as a composer, if he decides the right or wrong thing for the for the scene. It's sin for the, the the whole let's say for the whole character of the movie. Mm -hmm. That's very important. The movie is a collective work and it's of course a bunch of uh, subjective opinions and approaches. How to be objective now? That's very, very important. The only one has to be objective, being subjective, of course, is the director. But the director, by the end of the film, is completely lost because he has to, to deal with politics, <laughs> how to, you know, to, to keep good, good things with the studio and with the car actors, with, the, with the, you know, the labs and all that, and it becomes you know, almost impossible situation. And um, also, it's another thing which is very, very important. I found it very difficult for the for the final decision. Is that during the film, during the shooting of the film, and not only the shooting, but during the the um, editing, uh, for the right reasons, uh, editors they use music, not necessarily the, the the composer's music. By doing that you know, many, many times, over and over and again, because you have to, to, to cut this, change that, change the other. They get used to certain things, and then this is very bad, because if you bring another music, they don't, they feel uncomfortable. It's only human. I mean, if you, if you cut a scene maybe 30, 40 times with, with the music that you already chosen in order to cut it, then how are you going to to dress this, 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 this scene with another music. That's another big problem. Then you have the opinion of the editor, which editor and director, they're not the best friends, because the editor is another director. So they, you know, the producers. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, at the end we go into the producer, and then you have the, the wife of the producer, the girlfriend, who says, oh, you know, I don't think it's quite nice, and the producer with this is guy say, okay, cut this down, you know, all this bullshit. So, in the end, there's a big mess. There's a, there's a big mess. And uh, how you say that? Now? How you can fight this? Described <laughs> <laughs> it pretty well, actually. Yeah. So and. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, if you take Ridley, for example, I mean, and that, I think, again, you know this as, as well as I do, better than I do. I mean, at the end, uh, m most of the really good directors are completely unsure, not only of themselves, but of their work. So they are having, they are now, during the film, the actor is the insecure one, and the director's job is to hold his hand yes, and say, true. you're right. But at true. the end of the film, it's the director who's the insecure one, and looking around for someone true. who can say to him, true. it's all right, it's all right. You are in the middle of a big uh, you know, uh, typhoon and, 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 and a ship, 
and you are the captain and you don't know what to do. Because in the end, look, I try to discover what happens. Of course, the only thing is to navigate around all those kind of things and to find a way not to save yourself, but to save the movie. Because the movie, the best movie in the world, it's, it's, it's about to sink if you're not careful. And I, I, I saw things like that with very fantastic material, and then the movie, you know, just to, to become nothing at all. Because uh, there are some, somehow you lose distance and you lose uh, objectivity, and then, then you, you do the wrong thing by, by, by thinking that you do the right thing. And maybe, after all, it's by chance that the movie gets to the final positive result, because most of the times they don't. And then, of course, e even if the movie is good, maybe if the public, you know, I don't know, we say that the public is always right. But again, something that the public didn't like today, they like it maybe five years later. No, well, later on, it's taken 20 years. Exactly. So, but again, the thing is that when, when you do something to, to try to be as objective as possible and to try to do your best. Take in consideration a lot of things, global, not, not uh, uh, I like my music or I like my shot or I like my lighters, lighting, so I like my costumes, you know, like I, 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 I. I mean, it's, it's the whole thing how it works. It's a collective thing. It's very, very difficult, extremely difficult. All of the and, 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 and expensive, difficult and expensive. Of the directors you work with, I mean, is it your experience that some really have a good ear for music, some have no ear for music, some some wouldn't know a good piece of music if you played it to them? Let's put it uh, in a diplomatic way. <laughs> oh, it's the last thing to be undiplomatic. Mm. Yeah. Uh, no, the fact is, I mean, did you know very well, I mean, Hitchcock, uh, I'm told, just to take uh, a different yeah. example, I'm told, once Hitchcock had realized how important Bernard Herrmann was, he, Hitchcock swore, I mean, it's in his memoir, that he finished the film, gave it to Bernard Herrmann, the next time he saw the film, and yeah. well, it was at the premiere, when there was yeah. the Bernard Herrmann soundtrack, because he thought, Bernard Herrmann, what do I know? He'll do the soundtrack. So the famous scraping violins and the stabbing thing, for example, mm -hmm. Hitchcock had no idea what had made that sound. I mean, he had cloth ears. Yeah, I mean, he admitted it himself. So. He's just giving it to someone. Yeah. There then are it, others who think they know about it. Yeah, I mean, it. maybe in this case, uh, Hitchcock, the good thing is that he knew that he, he can't hear music, so he let somebody else worry about it. But as you said, I mean, sometimes, you know, people that they don't hear and they, and they think that they hear, that's very dangerous. But, you know, with composers, it's the same thing. Although I made a few films, I don't believe that uh, always music is necessary. And I don't try to place music. Sometimes I think in many movies, even Ridley or some people, they put more music than, than it's, it's uh, or louder than that is necessary. And this is, comes maybe uh, from insecurity, or comes because they don't feel that you know the scene it's it's strong enough and things like that. They just push the music in order to, and all that is is, is because of the industry itself. The movie industry, the, the, the film ind I mean the film industry, the music industry, the Olympic Games, it's all the same thing. Fashion, all the same. You have to deal with the industry more than the, what made the industry. You have to deal with the things around. I mean, like, like, like society, I mean, society, human being creates society in order to protect himself somehow, sometimes from nature or from, from you know, uh, loneliness or whatever, and now he has to deal with society as an enemy. His own creation becomes, you know, the most negative thing around him. So the, thing, the same thing with business, as we call it business, show business. Can you imagine even the world, show business? Show business and just destroy everything. What we get, we get money out of that, definitely, but we don't get the best out of the effort that thousands of people try Right, uh, right or wrong, because many people are involved which they shouldn't be involved. And who is, has the right to say who has to be involved or not. But anyway, we know that there are more, more creators than necessary. Creators in brackets, anyway. There's the famous story about um, the first time Amadeus was shown to mm. Sam Goldwyn Jr. 
Mm. They had no idea. Uh, I mean, he put up the money. Uh, they had no idea what, how he would react to this complicated film about Mozart. He'd never seen the play. And at the end, there was a silence while they waited for Goldwyn to speak. Nothing. Uh, he then asked for a telephone. And of course, it's before the days of mobile phones. So a telephone was brought in on a long wire, in the old Hollywood mm. wire, and he's talking. And um, Milos Schulman told me that uh, he's desperately listening for any word of compliment from Sam Goldwyn. And finally, um, he worked out that Goldwyn was talking to a woman on the telephone about their date that evening. Nothing to do with the film. But finally, the woman must have said to him, where are you? Oh, he said, I'm in a screening room. What have you seen? Well, I've just seen some film. I don't like the film, but my God, I'm going to sign up that composer. <laughs> <laughs> it's just true, true, true yeah, story. It's true story. Well, I mean, I'm sure I swear it's true. I mean, I assume it's true. Mm. Um, but being as diplomatic as possible, going back to what we said before, I mean, there are some, some who, who uh, clearly respond to music and some who don't that you've worked with. True. Yeah, I mean, the thing that uh, Stanley Kubrick did, <laughs> respond to music in a beautiful way. Ridley, Ridley, in a very strange way, he likes very, he's very, um, how can I explain, um, he takes the risk for some things. And he likes the unusual, not the conventional thing. I mean, according to my rapport with Ridley, with these two movies I, I made with him, um, but the the question is that uh, how much time the director you know can spend for things like that the moment that he has to spend for thousands of other things I mean it's very difficult very very difficult and now you have another of course another fashion did you have the musical advisor <laughs> which actually <laughs> is the link between himself and the record companies in order to, to plug music because films are, is today became the vehicle to sell records because record companies that don't sell anymore. So we have the film, so we have the, the musical advisors which they, they're shipping around in order to, you know, to get... I mean, come on, we know all those kind of things. Which is nothing wrong again, but doesn't help the end situation because always is an interest, a personal interest behind. Since we can see your painting up behind you, tell me how, how, did the, how and when did the painting begin? Same time, same, same time as music began. The only difference is that I kept, I kept it, uh, let's call it secret, outside of the, of the known, of the, the, let's call it career. I didn't want to mix everything because I wanted a, a field to be completely uh, you know, isolated and alone to work without having to do things for certain reason. And I still, you know, I did it uh, all my life like that, in a very serious way, quite serious. I mean, the way the, the painting is something that I can't, I can't speak, you know. But I, I have enormous, enormous. Uh, fulfillment and pleasure when I paint. Enormous. Uh, I mean, I could have been a painter, only a painter, not a musician, maybe, I don't know. If, but, you know, it happens to be both. But, uh, it's something that I can't explain when I just, I'm in front of a of a, of a canvas. And then it's, it's an enormous, enormous moment. Uh, it's a responsibility, what, uh, what I'm going to do. And if I do it like this, maybe I won't do nothing. It's just that boom, I go in and, and I, like the way I'm doing music, it's, I don't know what I'm going to do. And it, like this painting that you, you mentioned, you saw, it's, it happens, boom, like that. And that's it. But I don't, I don't want to impose to anybody because that's a very quite personal thing. Music is not personal. If you, if you approach it the way that I mentioned before, it's not personal. 
But painting is personal, very personal. So I didn't want to to impose anything. It's that's that's a, it's a pleasure. I could have made it a you know a, a, a commercial thing, a job, <laughs> something. Uh, but uh, I didn't, and I think it was very good that I didn't. Until maybe a few years ago, that uh, uh, rightly or wrongly, I decided to to give the permission for for an exp- exhibition. That's all. But uh, I don't know if I did it the right thing or the wrong thing. Yeah, you want no, no, I'm coming. Take the glasses off. We don't need them. Ah. Mm. You want to see it? Oh, it's a top. I wonder what it was. How you call it? Top. Yeah. Top. Spinning top. Spinning top. Spinning top. And this is the spinning topic. Topic comes from top. It's an interesting pun. Hmm? No, but it's an interesting pun. Hmm. See? Perfect. I spend hours like that. I spend hours and I spin hours. I spin hours. <laughs> <laughs> I try to improve my English. Your English is impeccable. No, 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 no. Terrible. I have a big problem. Big trouble. I tell you. Because the things, you know, I have to say, that they're very difficult and I can't find the right words and oh, it's a big pain. Ah, so I won't keep that here, right? You know what I mean then? Can you zoom a little bit to see, to see me without glasses? Yeah, zoom, zoom in. Zoom, in, zoom make, make a... I just changed base today and it doesn't feel, doesn't feel, you know, the right thing for me. Yes. Very distinguished. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay, George. <laughs> Let's go. Lights, action. Yeah. When you're ready, Mr. When it is. Close, close ups after lunch. No, you remember the joke no, with all me. the cameras that yeah. no, no camera, this explosion, uh, all the cameras are off. Oh, oh. And this one, the yeah. last hope. <laughs> when you're ready. <laughs> well, there's a. Otherwise, it was with Demille, no? Yeah, it was Demille. Mm. There's a wonderful story, though. <laughs> There's a, there's a wonderful story um, uh, uh, <coughs> Richard Burton tells about, we were talking about Cleopatra yesterday, yeah. and um, it was the entrance of Cleopatra and where she first sees Mark Antony or Mark Antony. Oh, in Rome? Yeah, in Rome. And she comes on on an elephant. And at first Elizabeth had to be convinced that it was completely safe to be on top of that elephant. So she's strapped onto the elephant, you can't see it. So there's no way she can fall off. I mean, the elephant. Only the elephant can fall. Only the elephant fall off, but she could not possibly fall off. And they they rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed this scene the day after, without (coughs) her, of course, the day after to get the elephants to come on. And of course, there are lots of dancing girls who are kind of doing this. And they had to have zebras. Well, there weren't any zebras that were tame, so they had horses which they had to paint. To paint zebras, yeah. With pajamas. Exactly. (laughs) I mean, this has gone on the day after day after day. Finally, they're absolutely ready. Finally, Elizabeth's persuaded to get up onto the elephant. So she's now on the elephant, and this, the horses have been... And it's boiling hot because it's in Rome. Horses have been painted black and white, and the paint is already starting to run, so they're in panic, you know, you're going to have stripy, mm. really stripy horse zebras and so on. 
and they've got cameras absolutely everywhere because they realise they probably could only do this once, you see. So now everything is ready. And Mankiewicz is up on a very high tower. Richard Burke is standing there looking imperious. Elizabeth comes on, shaking with fear on top of this elephant, but trying to smile at the same time. And of course, she's got an enormous head. You know, it's an enormous head. Never the same, ever to get ready, so it's just mad. Which actually, the head is a little bit tilted. It's not, <laughs> I know. I remember the scene, yes. Anyway, so they, now that it's, everything is going, roll up, you see, and you've got 10 cameras everywhere, every conceivable angle to do everything, you see. And Mankiewicz is up the top, just trying to watch it, and you crack, cast a thousand, you know, zebras, paints running, and everything. And so, Suddenly he leans forward, according to Richard Burton. It was going perfectly, as far as Richard Burton could see. And he heard this enormous voice saying, Cut! Cut! So they have to stop the elephant does this, and then there's this swaying like this. And why, why happened? In the crowd, for the four days they'd rehearsed it, there was a guy selling ice creams, and he didn't realise it was a take. <laughs> no. So you see in the master shot, a guy in the background selling ice creams. So it took another four days to persuade Elizabeth to get back up on oh, the elephant. shit. Because they couldn't turn the elephant around. Um, what happened to the guy? Uh, I think he probably was put into the ice cream mixer. <laughs> because at the time they didn't have computers, no, so everything was real. They had to do it again. <sighs> story, though. Yes, I was thinking to, ho to go for a pee or to continue and maybe cut and have a pee. Up to you. No, let's start and then okay. we have a pee. Right. Pee time. Have a, have a pee break. Pee break. Pee break, as opposed to a tea break. Yes, right. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, let's go from the uh, ridiculous to the sublime and go back to what we were talking about at lunchtime, right? Um, oh. You, you want to do that? Well, I mean, we, we began to talk about it. It's a very, very interesting subject. I so mean, what, what do you want me to say? Well, I don't want you to say anything, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's, what, am I, it, what, what am I doing here? It's, it's, no. it's, it's very hard to make films about people. Yes, it is. So you question why you're doing it. Why, why I mean, I question when I'm doing it uh, according to what, you know, what I think, I'm thinking about all those things. But by saying that, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really more difficult and more ridiculous because in one hand, uh, I don't like doing that, and the other hand, I'm doing it. So it's a little bit uh, contra contradictory, isn't it? And uh, of course, you know that for nine years, We've been discussed it <laughs> since we've met, and uh, the answer was not, you know, positive, right? Well, it was not one thing. Not nothing, nothing against you. It's just, no. just uh, you know. So I don't know. Uh, I think this is interesting. Talk, talking about myself is not easy. Talking about other things, uh, it's uh, easier. But then you have to go into heavy stuff, you know, serious stuff and all that. And uh, because otherwise, you know, we do a, a pleasant blah, blah without interest. And uh, you see, I don't want to, uh, I, I, I don't like to, to criticize anybody, uh, but uh, I won't accept, you know, to, um, to be thrown at me, all this garbage, all this trash, right, uh, deliberately. and. I'd, I can't accept that. I mean, I can't say not to me, to you, to everybody. I mean, I'm not judging, but I, I don't accept taking as well everything that's going on around, which is not very pleasant. I mean, we're talking about real stuff, not, not talking about light uh, conversation, you know. So, and talking about God, the real stuff, then you become boring or negative, because people they don't want to hear things like this. So, I was thinking that if I'm doing this to promote myself, then it's useless because I don't want to promote anything. If you want to, to do that because I have to say a few things, then those things are not so pleasant. So, as we said before, it's to be or not to be. <laughs> 
This is the question, you know, it's, the, it's to say or not to say things. In that sense. But anyway, maybe we shouldn't get into that. It's just I have to put, to make this remark, because I just felt it like that. Yeah. That's it. Let's come back to it. But one thing we began to talk about last night, just as, just as I was going, yeah. we, we started to talk about, um, in relation to the, the drums and the, the reeds that I saw. Yeah. Um, the... Where's the microphone? Oh. <laughs> Who's that? There's another yeah. one over there. Uh, about, um, yeah. I said, if you think of Greek folk music, you think of uh, Bazookis. And one of the remarkable things about many of the things of yours that I've heard and seen is this is a different, not folk music, but a different tradition of almost ancient Greek music, if you see what I mean. I mean yeah. How has this image come about that Greek folk music is just Bazookis? Well, here we are again. We, we I have to talk for things that maybe I shouldn't because... I can't fight this uh, unfortunate situation that happens, you know, and all this uh, uh, epidemical uh, bouzouki, you know, uh, era. And and you can't go against, you know, uh, let's say 10 million people that, you know, they, they listen to the bouzouki, you know, all day, today, you know. But uh, and it's better not not to to go through it because it won't be a very pleasant uh, discussion. But anyway, uh, I don't believe that uh, you know whatever happens, this is uh, this music. It's uh, the uh, ethnic music of Greece. Definitely, it's one areas and periods music. But uh, maybe became a little bit uh, more uh, not important, but more used than, than it should be. There are other things very, very important, which uh, gradually they don't get the same treatment and they die and, and you know they, they get transformed. I mean, some extraordinary riches in different areas of Greece. Ethnic music, incredible ethnic music, very ancient, much older than the current uh, popular music. Um, but anyway, I mean, it's better for me not not to go deeper to that, hoping that uh, there are some uh, other occasions, maybe later, that you know. The music will be developed in a different way than the one the one that is happening today. Okay, but I mean a lot of um, a lot of uh, music that I when I yeah I hear your music I hear some something else um, which tells me that it's of Greece. Yeah, Euthydemus perfect example. Yeah. Um, doesn't sound like bazooki music. I mean, I'm, I'm caricaturing bazooki music. Oh, yeah. Now, I wondered where that interest came from and, and how you developed it. I mean, even the bazooki music, the one that you, you mentioned, and you know, even the name, which comes from, from an instrument, is because it was, it was promoted to you. But nothing else has been promoted to you. It's never, nothing else has been promoted out of Greece except that. And that happened, you know, since the 50s, from the Nevero Sunday. Which Greece, you know, had a big success in Cannes. Then, then all the, let's say, this kind of image, were semi-touristic, semi, whatever, semi anyway, starts to build, and then Greece became, you know, known known like this. It was a kind, you know, like a mark. So that's why you know, and that's why we talk about it. Uh, and but there are other things, uh, very very important, a very noble which they never had the same chance. And they don't, still, still today, they don't have the same chance. I mean, when I, when I touch the area of, of ethnic music and ancient music, I will, I will go straight to the oldest memory, which I can reach. And, that's, and I'm very, very, very concerned about, not only about my country, but about every country. And um, to, to preserve the roots and, and this ethnic richness 
because it's very, very important uh, for each country. And uh, I remember in Paris, uh, very early 70s, I've been trying to convince the record companies um, to invest and to to be interested in in that type of that area of music, the the the, the, the ethnic what we call ethnic today. That was early seventies, maybe seventy one, seventy two, something like that. And of course, nobody was interested, especially you know in in, in uh, talking about ethnic music in France because of the colonies, like you have in England. Have a, they have a lot of had a lot of companies uh, colonies in in Africa. Mm-hmm. Therefore, you know, they had uh, access to the African folklore, which is uh, superb, very, very rich and extraordinary, great quality. And I've met a lot of African people, which actually they they sang, you know, in an extraordinary way, something that became very, very uh, known and uh, and create big hits during the you know the late eighties. To the nights, but all this, all this period, nothing, because nobody was interested in ethnic music. I remember uh, one of the of the things that I like when I work with Ridley and, uh, and Blade Runner is because Ridley, uh, it wasn't against to to to, to use ethnic uh, uh, perfume, uh, ethnic uh, you know sound. Blade Runner, and I was quite, quite, very, very happy, which I did, but nothing happened again <laughs> until you know, until late eighties, which actually the ethnic thing started, and now sometimes the ethnic, the ethnic, became also sometimes not serious because, you know, whatever happens every time, you know, becomes a little bit, uh, he loses his uh, strength, and as they overdo it, and you know, some. Some things happen without without the, the, the proper quality. But uh, to go back to the, the the first things we said, I believe that the strongest thing for each each country is, is the roots and and the ethnic the ethnic memory the ancient. I do it by instinct. I never sat down and say what is the most important to do to do this or to do that. Came naturally to me, and I. When I perform and when I when I do those kind of things, the reaction of of the, the people is extraordinary, because it's it, it hits you know to some some very hidden uh, places in in their souls maybe, and you have this extraordinary reaction. I mean, for I'm talking maybe you know I gave an example for my country, but I mean every country is exactly the same thing. And they should treasure that, instead of copying, you know, the 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 current fashion, and this current fashion uh, also carries a lot of unnecessary, uh, between brackets, goods. I mean, it it comes back down. It comes again to the subject we talked about a lot yesterday, and very interestingly about uh, commercial. Uh, commercialization is too simple. Um, but this, every tourist that gets on a plane at mm. the airport here, they think yeah. Greek music, they think bazooki. Oh, right. for, for reasons that we... Yeah, for reasons, reasons accordion and yeah. uh, uh, Scotland, the pipes and, you yes. know, okay, yeah, I know, I know. But that, in, in a, but what you're saying is, if I understand it correctly, is in a, in a very in real sense that does, that does damage to the ancient roots, if you like. For some reason, they, they, don't, they don't. To me, they don't match. And hearing the music that's happening here in Greece, and looking looking through the, the through the whole, I mean, the whole civilization, they, they don't match those kind of things. I don't know. But again, I, you know, I'm trying not to say things. Instead of saying things, and uh, then we go in the middle way again. Because if I go all the way, maybe I shouldn't. Because you know, uh, and then we open really the Pandora's do- box. Well, and maybe we shouldn't. To peek eh? inside the lid if we don't. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. It's always a reason because uh, why because things happen. Things that don't happen because they happen. They happen because it's a reason. Sometimes because they've been prepared years ago or because for, for many natural reasons. And um, I mean even when I say natural reasons, not from nature. From reasons that uh, it's like a chain, one comes after the other. And um, and I don't know if that subject anyway interests anybody to talk about why in Greece that happens today and what in Spain or what in France. Or, I mean, maybe there are subjects which maybe we have to to make a special talk about the issue and then start to analyze thoroughly each <laughs> every point, you know, to be to be understood because like this. Again, I will I will sound like I'm criticizing things. I'm not. I'm just just analyzing. It doesn't sound like criticism. Well, I think you worry uh, about that too much. It, does, it really doesn't sound like criticism. But again, I go back to to um, my main point, which is that I think when you listen to your music, take the take the march um, uh, in the World Games thing that I have to use. I mean, that is an unmistakable sound of Greece. But it doesn't sound like bazookis. It does sound like you, but it also sounds like something from a far distant memory, if you see what I mean, mm-hmm. which has been brought to life. And I think that achievement, which is yours, uh, is something which should be celebrated. As simple as that. I don't know. Well, I mean, that, that's my, uh, my feeling about it. I'm, I will, I I'm just will. curious to know... Uh, we got that wonderful bit of film now that you yeah. provided if you with the drums and with the the reeds. Yeah. Now, that's a conscious attempt to do something. If you see what I mean, and I'm just curious how you got to that point. Well, I I think I got to that point by memory because I always always said the few times that I I, I spoke out that you know memory is a very important thing and we learn more by memory than by by learning if we go to school because. We learn. We think that we learn, but only we remember what what we know already. That's very very important thing. You see, you think that you learn that. I mean, yes, we can learn some details, but the important things we know. The only thing is that we don't remember those things because the system doesn't allow us to remember anything of those kind of things. If you remember, you're going to find out that you know more than you think you know, and. Uh, through maybe this memory uh, path, I felt the way the way I felt, and um, um, how can I put it? Uh, also, you know, as I said before, the moment that happens, it's like like everybody agrees that something is moving there, and it's 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 normal because it's ancient. And it's extremely important. Not because it's ancient, because the more ancient something uh, is, the more yours is. Mm-hmm. What is ours? Ours is something that lasts for forever. I mean, forever, but you know, the ever in this case, when the moment is now, is the ever is the past. Where we come from. And that's very, very important. Something that uh, deliberately today, uh, the system tried to, to cut us off. So that that's extremely important, very very important. But anyway, you know what else I can say. <laughs> Let's change tack and, and and keep that in the memory bank. In the memory bank, memory yes. Bank. Okay. Um, can I be very personal and ask you about your father? Seems to me from what I know, from little you've told me, from what I've read. My father. Mm. Well, then we're going to area the personal area now that I don't think interests anybody. Well, <laughs> well you simple. Your um, father was... You tell me. Well, I, I, well, the only thing I can say about my parents is that they... they I had the, 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 you know, the chance to have wonderful parents. 
people that you know very very noble and very very honest and uh, very nice people and uh, you know both they like very much the arts my father was not an artist but my father loved you know the music and we used to go to concerts and things like that together my mother she she was playing the piano that's why you know I found the piano this this uh, you know, piano at home, and then she was she was a mezzo soprano, which I never she never, of course, became a professional because at the time it was not seen very well to to, to be an artist. You know, this society rules, right? And um, that's it. And they never they never never uh, stopped me by doing things that I would like to do. Partly because they've been very very sensitive. And partly because I started so early, and I never gave them a chance for something else. So that was obvious when they see, you know, a child, they, you know, just start to play its own compositions at the age of three to four. I can't remember. It was, you know, it was very difficult to say to this child, "Don't do that." And also because partly they, you know, they've been music lovers and art lovers and, and all that. I think this is what I have to say, which is the, the essence of my parents, and I'm very glad and grateful to have to have parents like this. Of course, I don't have them anymore, but, you know... But it's interesting, your father wasn't a musician. No, he was not a musician, but, you know, he was really very, very front to the, you know, to music and all that. What did he do? Uh, he was a... a kind of, uh, hmm. I don't know the name, actually, how to say it in English. Um, uh, we do a playback to this. Where do we find the name? <laughs> <laughs> when you remember the name? When I remember the you know the title, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And your brother, who we see in the in the film. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, what, uh, I mean, I knew that you had a brother, but he's he's dealing with the fabrics, isn't he? In the, in the no, no, my, my my brother also. It's a very artistic. It's um, he he used to actually he used to he went to the music school. He used to play the piano, and is good on you know with uh, drawing and uh, with um, he did a lot of uh, interior decoration and things. I mean, whatever he does is, is very, very artistic and very sensitive. And he's been into music business as well. You never started a group, the two of you? No. We, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we play a little bit together, just, you know, sometimes. He used to play a little bit the percussions. <coughs> but, but no. No. Every bit of film you showed us yesterday that included you, Especially, infamously, the uh, press conference, uh, the, the uh, press conference. Oh yes. You look very unhappy and very uncomfortable. I think is the, is the word. Well, I'm always uncomfortable when I have, you know, I'm in front of a camera, and I have to say things like I am now. Don't think I'm not. But uh, especially at that time, I was very unhappy because I had a lot of problems. I mean, incredible. But again, it's something that I don't want to talk about because. Uh, it's very unpleasant. I've been through hell. I almost, you know, it almost never. You know, we risked not to, to, you know, to, to perform. It was really, I, I was really um, put against, uh, you know, incredible. Uh, I can explain. Um, Pressure. Yes, underground as well. A lot, a lot of things. I mean, sabotage, things like that. Some people didn't want to happen. This thing. But anyway, it's very unpleasant to talk about that. I mean, the, the, the thing is that Methodia happened and it was a great success and, and uh, you know, I don't want to say any more. You have now the, you know, the, yes, yes, the no, videotape. I wasn't wanting to pry into, into those yeah. problems, but it was just, it's, I was trying to get you back to this business of, of cameras and talking about yourself and all of that stuff, yeah. which, which is obviously um, painful for you in some ways. Yes, it is painful. It is painful because I think yesterday we mentioned about 
live performances and things like that. And the most difficult, talking about the live performance, is that the two sides, they have the same goal, the same motivation. It doesn't happen, because my goal and motivation very rarely agrees with the goal and motivation of the other side, which organized the concert. And this, these two things, the clash, because I don't think commercial, I, don't think, I think just in a completely different terms. And the squeeze in a different terms for other, you know, for maybe unnecessary reasons, which I'm not concerned. So these two things, they're about not to, to happen. It's not a question of um, being difficult or being, you know, complicated and all that. It's very, very simple. I think that uh, whatever happens, the two sides, they have to have the same direction. And this doesn't happen, you know very well that it doesn't happen in this business. Except, of course, if you have people that they, they are so egocentric and they have so much need to be promoted and need to be shown and need to be, to move their asses on stage, you know, and to, to demand success and demand, you know, to impose things in a very, very aggressive way, then in this case, they go really uh, very well with the, the, the other side and, you know, they do whatever they do. I don't want to mention names again, but that's not what it means. <laughs> then both, both they're, they're, they're accomplished, as we say, yeah. yeah. But, it, I mean, I yeah. think you also have to face the fact that, I mean, it, it, the, the music should speak for itself, the painting should speak for themselves. Um, it's, it's impertinent to quiz someone and say, what does that piece of music mean, or what does that painting mean? Because if you knew, you'd write it down in words, rather than do it, if you see what I mean. don't think I would have done, if, if I knew, I don't think I would have been able to do it. How do I know? I mean, even knowing, we say knowing, uh, we say, I know this. What do we mean when we say, I know this? Whenever, it's, it's, we, if we start thinking, uh, in which way you know what you say that you know? <laughs> and I don't want to go deeper to that, but I mean, again, it's, it's something that, in a very, very easy, we say, we know, but we don't know. Or maybe, what we know, we don't think that we know. It, it is, it's, it's very complicated. And uh, I'm not trying to be complicated, but through the years, many, many simple things, they become very complicated because we don't mean what we're saying. And we don't say what we mean. And that, that creates a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. I mean, we think that uh, a lot of things are necessary, which are totally unnecessary. We spend fortunes on necessary things. I remember one thing of you know Socrates, which which uh, somebody saw Socrates in the marketplace. Says, "What are you doing here?" They say, "You can't imagine how happy I am to see what I don't need." <laughs> you know, right? Okay, you, you see, you see what I mean. But I mean. Even you, you don't have to go as far as that, but I mean, you know, 80% of the things that we, we've been uh, asked uh, to, to buy every day, uh, those things are, un are unnecessary. And if we don't buy, we, we feel insecure because we don't have... You see, it's crazy to feel insecure because you don't have the unnecessary. <laughs> That's crazy, you think. Once you possess the unnecessary, then you feel secure with unnecessary things. Schizophrenia, isn't it? I mean, that, that sometimes I do it myself, you know, it's... it's <laughs> I'm not, again, I'm not criticizing anything. I just, you know... Anyway. I mean, it's, what's fascinating both yesterday and today is to actually talk about music in... in uh, um, but you, you started it off yesterday, I was going to say, talking about music in a philosophical way. Mm. Um, but you quite rightly said, you know, that, that 
I'm caricaturing it now, you said it much more eloquently, that, but there is a music about us, there's a music about our being, there's a music about our souls, as it were. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to find a way to communicate that. Um, but it is very unusual to talk about music in purely philosophical terms. It I, mean, is, I think it's important. I'm, I'm yeah, not, it, is, it is unusual, because when you have so many centuries that the music became what, what it became, for the right or the wrong reasons, uh, the music became what it became because it's, the music has been treated like that. And it's been treated because the, um, the human beings, through the years, they, uh, they've been brought up in, a, in, a, in that way. Uh, at least I'm talking about the Western civilization, if you want. You know, there are other countries that they still keep a different approach to music, like India, for example, that they play different music, you know, in the morning, you know, different in the evening, different in the night, uh, which, and, and for us that, that it's, um, you know, it sounds quite crazy, I mean, quite unusual. But if uh, deeper we go into the music and, 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 the, and this, the whole mechanism and how it works, maybe we're going to find out that... Uh, uh, is something extremely important and quite different from the one that we think it is. Do we want it or not? We are surrounded and covered by music. We are made by music. Now, what we do with music is it's the, the, the mirror of our present state. The way that we treat in music, uh, if we know how to, to, to read that, immediately we know the state of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the human being the moment that, that, you know, that this event happens. For example, today we have this music, we put the music down, we don't have to see the people. And by reading this, analyzing this, we know in what situation these people are. Uh, the, the music, it's, it's just, you know, a code. Not a code by, by itself, but it's another code, the, the, the moment that the people manufacture music. Because we manufacture music as well. It's not only we made by music, but we manufacture. But we manufacture music in a different way. In this different way, by analyzing it, we can see the state of, of, of each, you know, period, human beings, you know, civilization and all that. But that's a different, uh, uh, di different approach and it needs um, a lot of maybe seminaries to, you know, well, to explain. Well, we're not doing too bad. Yeah. So, I mean, really what you're saying is that if you want to know about a people at a particular time or a civilization at a mm. particular time... Go to music, go to, to their music. Yeah, and so... The, the, the corollary of that is that if you looked around at what, well, I'm sorry to keep going back to the bazookis, if you, as it were, heard the bazookis, that tells you a lot about Greek society, which is not anciently truthful, if I yeah. can put it this way. Well, uh, let's, put it, yeah, let's put that away. It's not up to me to criticize that, but history in the future will, will analyze by that music what state would, was Greece today or England today, or Spain today, or France today, or maybe 50, or 100 years ago, or maybe 500 years ago. And then maybe you can predict in the future what's going to happen, which sometimes today is a little bit difficult to predict because of this uniformity that happens. Because it doesn't allow each country to develop, to develop itself, it's it, all the influences and the pressures which change the whole, the whole situation. But then it's not a very pretty picture. Pretty picture? No, I don't think so. No, it's not. It's not because it's, it's false, it's manufactured. That's the problem, it's the manufactured thing. And what we do, it's like, it's like against the, the human itself. Because the, the primary reason is money. How to make money. How to impress and how to make money. Money, 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 money. And the, answer, the, the question is, yes, but how, what are we going to do with that money? Maybe the answer is, maybe we can't, we need. But to monopolize the whole humanity and to put it at, at the, 
the the money um, boot. I think this is something that destroys more than anything else. It's not it's not me to say that. You see around you what's happening, the motivation. Even even young people, 15 years old, the only thing they want is money. Be famous and money. Now, how to get money? That's another thing. How to be famous is another thing. What do you have to do in order to get that? That's the big thing. True or not? People that they have properties and they uh, they <coughs> they get you know the a landlord. No. Landlord, yes, landlord. Was a la oh, I thought he was a landlord. Landlord, yes, that's. Okay. Well, yeah, I can go back and say that. Okay, well, let me let me come back to it when, when we go because this is important what we're saying. Now, we we this is is now really coming back to what we were talking about lunchtime because the, the thing that is absolutely despicable and I can be critical even if you don't want to be, but mm. the thing that is absolutely despicable and unforgivable about present society is the the cult of the personality, the desire to be famous. It's not famous for fifteen minutes. I mean, look at these ridiculous um, uh, uh, reality shows on television, you know, Big Brother and all that. This is, I'm sure they're terribly nice people, but they're put in a situation that's completely artificial. They do it in order to become famous. Now, I mean, how worth it. They have no, they're, they're only famous for being famous. Paris Hilton, take an obvious example. Okay, I mean, but that's the, yeah. that is... That, that is a despicable in my book, but also, I mean, that's the end of any real value about the human personality, it seems to me. But this is the point, the end of the, the, the real value. And we have to do, we have to achieve the end of the real value, because then we can rule in a, in a much easier way. The thing is that... <laughs> Sorry, what, what do you mean by that? By destroying all that, then you, you can rule the masses better, easier. The thing is that it's the vicious circle because the ed education, I mean, we are educated by the television and by the, you know, the, 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 uh, all, all the, the, you know, the medias and all that in order to, to like and to accept that. M most of the things we like today, as we said before, are unnecessary. So uh, what you don't like, you said you don't like this, you don't like that, and that's terrible. Is that what, what has been promoted for years? I mean, a kid today, 10 or 15 years old, I mean, or even before that, in the eight or five, what they watch on television, this, what they want to become stars. They don't know what that is. And it's a very, very um, immoral. In one hand, of course, well, you have two, two, uh, two big factors. The one is the vanity, which comes from, from the artistic side, if you want the artist between brackets. And, and the greed which comes from, from the business side. Now, vanity and, and, and greed, they're so, you know, they, they really like brothers and sisters, like lovers. They, they, they love each other. Put vanity and greed, and they, you become really famous. And the vanity is provided by, by the artistic side, and the greed is provided by, by, by the business side. And they agree totally. And that's why, I mean, whatever big you, you, you agree or disagree is the reason that happens. And the reason that happens is because people like it. And then you can't fight that. I mean, that's why I'm saying is to go out and say what you're doing is wrong. Even if it's wrong, the moment that they like it, well, what are you going to say? In a democratic way, which I'm great, you know, right? and democracy is very important, is wrong. I mean, because, I mean, Democracy says this. I mean, you know, and if you know the, the people want that, they want this. Maybe they're wrong, you know. But how you can stop this? You can stop it, of course, with education. The only way is education. But the education again is it's it's somehow uh, geared geared. It's, it's it's arranged in order to to bring those kind of things. Because it's the wrong education, although they pretend it's the right education. But that is an enormous issue that we can't go now. I mean, it's not the type of discussion. But the only remedy is education. It's not to stop things and not to permit things and not to ban things and to do to, to censorship and all that. That's even worse. It's 
not to have the need to do that. How, how, how you can educate people not to smoke? You can't. It's just the people not to have the need to smoke. For instance, without saying smoke is good or bad. Of course we know for, for the health is bad. And it's ridiculous. <coughs> see people smoking, for example, after maybe 100 years in films, say, what are they doing? It's just they got fire. Yeah, it's, it's bad. It's been promoted and promoted and promoted for years because, and of course, it becomes like a drug. And people like it. And of course, it's, you know, I like to smoke a cigar after, 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 you know, after dinner. That's a different type of thing. Of course, it's not smoking all day. But, and, I just I made the point about smoking, just, just an example. All the things are like this. And even talking about music, uh, I don't think people, they're going to like what I'm going to say, but from the 60s, the, 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 uh, the sex, drugs and rock and roll situation, I mean, which became, you know, a just turning point, a social turning point, I don't have to say, you know, the results. You can, you can tell me before I tell you what's happening. Oh, this incredible marketing like, that started from England. I knew it was our fault. No, it's not a question of fault. No, it's, it's, you know, and how, how many mediocre guys, I mean, you know, became famous by selling nothing and give the, you know, the, the, the example to, to, to kids in order, you know, they're old now and they're doing exactly the ridiculous same thing. But I mean, you know, the kids, where they, they have to, to do something to react. And, you know, they, they <laughs> I don't want to go into details things that I lived because, you know, I spent a long time in, in, in England. But, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's madness what's happening. In order to impress, to impress, to impress, to influence, to, to impose, and to make money. And most of these guys in these groups that don't have money, I mean, some other people that have the money, you know that as well. And through that is drugs, it's the, the way of the behavior, everything. And I'm saying, I'm not judging anything, but we complain, everybody does, that things that don't go uh, the way that they should go. And I'm asking, I mean, why they don't go? Maybe one, this is one of the reasons that they don't go, because here, there, you, you see a kind of, uh, through the music, with this behavior, it's a, it's a kind of education as well. You educate the kids when you go to a concert. You decay the kids when you make a film. You decay when you make a television program. And you semi-educate anymore the, the, the kids when you go to school. The families are already uh, contaminated. <laughs> so you see, we're going through the unpleasant stuff again. And, no, no, no. Uh, no, no, I don't think, I mean, I know you feel that, and I, I, I don't feel this at all because I mean, the world of television has the same uh, problem, uh, which it cannot seem to want to resolve, than mm. when you were talking about music. I mean, mm. the, uh, the arts on television have certainly diminished mm. to the extent that, uh, as it were, personality shows yeah. have increased. So that all television, I mean, the people who run the television, who make money from the ads, all they are interested in is, oh, let's have these meaningless, vacuous, pointless uh, personality exercises so that television no longer occupies the position of helping towards an understanding or helping towards an education that it did certainly when I started. It's now an uphill struggle to get that kind of material onto television because it prefers, as it were, Big Brother. I'm just using Big Brother as an example. So, I mean, it isn't only the music world that, which is, is, is forced. No, it's everything. Yeah. Yeah. But it's another, you know, it's one phrase that I totally disagree because it's so easy to come out. Because when we say things and we complain or criticize, you know, certain things uh, in, on television and music or any kind of, of area, they say, but uh, we give people what they want. And I think it's totally moral and wrong to say that because we... Uh, we push people and we educate people 
to give them what we want. But it appears that this is what people want, which actually in the end maybe this is what they want, but in order to, to get there to want this, they didn't get there alone. Somebody worked and pushed in order to, 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 to form a kind of public which can sell rubbish. And this rubbish, it's something which is unhealthy, which doesn't make the, the human being better. Because after all, what is the, the purpose of art? To make people better, not some other, another silly phrase that people say, I, you know, um, represent or I'm, uh, you know, inspired by my, you know, the, the current situation, the problems of things. I mean, what's better to express that than television and the newspapers? Better than any artist in the world. The art is there to give something which is timeless and to make you feel better and to cure all the, you know, the, to clean you like a filter from all the bad things and let the other, other stuff to do, the, you know, the, to be, you know, let's say, to, to, to talk about the current things. I'm expressing, you know, my time. So if, you know, you have people killing, then you kill. No, I tell you, <laughs> it's one thing that I will never forget, and I never forget, especially what happened a few days ago, uh, back in England, in London, I had a discussion with some friends, uh, and that was mid-70s. And uh, I think something it was exhibited at the, you know, the National Gallery that was totally, you know, stupid and, you know, things in order to create uh, impression to impress people, because this is the point now, to impress, not to, how can I explain, uh, to inspire, but to impress. That's a big difference between inspire someone and to impress someone. So I was really, I was, you know, getting really, you know, upset and tired and angry about all this discussion. I say, listen guys, I mean, why are you going around and around and around all the time to impress? That's one thing to impress. Let's do it and finish with it. Go to a morgue, take some corpse, throw it in the gallery, and don't talk about it. And then that you, you reach maybe the, you know, the, the top of impression, right? Of course, I could have done that. I could have been in prison maybe at the time. And then I could have been very, very famous, right? Now, unfortunately, you have one of the biggest names in England, which does almost that. And you know the name, I won't never, I, know, I don't say the name. And he, he takes millions of pounds for this. You see, it's easy to be rich like that, but then it's a kind of self-respect. So I'm talking about 75. And it's exactly the same thing that's happening today, that 2008, and for me, when I said this, it was just like a, a reaction, knowing that there's nothing else you can do. Because I saw a guy, I mean, cutting himself, you know, on stage and walking in a, in a, in a white uh, corridor and with blood. That's art. See what I mean? Or make, you know, uh, another lady which transforms her, her face. And she's been paid for that in order to, be, to become a monster. And all the kids that, you know, they have holes everywhere. And it reminds me of the Scorpio that you put it in a, you know, in a round of fire and then it commits suicide. You know that with mm -hmm. the Scorpio does. It's exactly the same thing with society now. We are really surrounded by crap. And we, we try, you know, to, you know, to harm ourselves. So I will never forget this, this, this discussion I had. And then, you know, after all this time, I said to myself, if I, I should have done it, then I would have been very rich to me. But really, so, I mean, it's pathetic. I mean, I think the key phrase there was, was uh, self-respect. I mean, uh, it's the sort of denial of self-respect almost, isn't it? To pursue that. Why to impress? Why try to impress? 
you go to, to art galleries today and you see crap, 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 crap. And that's one thing, because let's say that everybody is allowed, I don't know if he's allowed, but let's say he's allowed to do whatever he likes. The other guy that promotes that, then that's you know, that the difficult thing starts. And, and, and something that you can criticize, not the guy that does it, but the, try, the guy that tries to sell it. And the whole, the whole organization around this crap to sell that, to impose this like, like the new art. And if you, don't, uh, if you don't like that, then you are the stupid one because you are, you are very conservative. You see? And uh, in order not to be conservative, you have to, you know, to, to go to, to this far, which is, doesn't serve anything except an impression and except the guy that was going to put the money in his pocket. Now, you could say, I mean, you hinted at it there, or you didn't use the phrase, I mean, you could say that the whole um, ethos of plastic surgery is doing exactly that, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's deforming. Something. But uh, again, you do it to yourself. And this is another thing, that, uh, that 90% of the operations in every hospital all over the world are this type of operations. Suddenly, you know, okay, we know that, that women, they carry this insecurity of beauty and all that, but, you know, to that extent, it's incredible. There's been a lot of promotion. There have been films on television and see serials like that. So, that's whatever way we, we can make money, let's make the money. The costs, I mean, the human cost is, doesn't matter. And this is actually the big uh, irony and hypocrisy. Because on the other hand, we, we say we, we, we care about the people. How we care about the people? We don't care about our own children. We give them this, this junk every day. How we can care about it? All these filmmakers, the producers, all these films, they, they have children. How they can produce films like that? But they have, of course, the censorship. And then you have really to say, yes, but you know, I can't keep the, <laughs> cut the hand or I cut the throat and all that. Yeah, but that's hypocritical. The whole system is there, you know, to, to, to make you feel dumb completely. And, and, you, know, to... you obviously feel very, very, uh, I think angry is the word about it. Yes, uh, yes, you, you, you know, sometimes I feel angry because, because of the hypocrisy. And because of, of uh, with this unnecessary discussions after dinner, sometimes, and people trying to, to be clever and to go into the, you know, the, the, uh, the center of the problem, and all this bullshit. And nobody does nothing, because there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. The more we go deeper, there's nothing you can do. So. I want to relate that back to um, we mentioned you, brought, you mentioned it yesterday, and then you shied away from it slightly. That, as you said, film making films is a kind of collective art. Mm -hmm. No, you didn't use the word art. It's a collective enterprise making mm -hmm. film, um, and it would not be true to say I don't think that a film that works works um, more by luck than judgment. But a film that really works, there's, there's one imagination which is driving it forward and hopefully in spite of this sort of collectiveness gets there in the end, however inadequately in terms yeah. of their vision. Now just thinking about that as a general idea, I mean, tell me anything that you want really about any of the experiences that you've had in, in making films that seems to work against that and the problems that... I mean, you mentioned. In, in, in I mean, I think you can talk about Oliver and and. Um, no, I, I tell you, I, that's a perfect example. I tell you a, a general impression. You know, I don't dislike working on films, although it's a very, very painful situation, and it's painful because of all these kind of things. Because uh, it's it's not simple. It's it's also contains all the things around, all the pressures, because everybody is, is under pressure. And uh, the film is a very, very, very difficult business because, first of all, it costs a lot of money. And many things are there on stake. So already, the people that are working for a film, they are, 
they are really in, in, a, in, a, in a great pressure. This is what I feel. And through the whole films, I mean, every film I've done is the same situation, more and less. All the rest, it's, it's, it's irrelevant. If, for example, this director is uh, more sympathetic than the other one, or a little bit more aggressive, or the other uh, softer, or maybe, you know, things like this are not important. What is important is once you enter in that, that area of, of, of being part of, of, of a film, then you enter into a ring and you can, you know, you, you have to, 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 take, to take all this, you know, punches that happens every day. And you have to, to, uh, to, um, to sail around all these pressures and problems, the everyday problems that can, can happen uh, from, you know, something, a stupid thing or something that nobody thought or maybe a mistake or something like that. You don't have the time. And this is how I can really characterize the, the, the area of working in a film. Now, of course, each film has its moments, stories, uh, you know, you can laugh, you, can, you know, but, but uh, it's not an unpleasant situation because you can see something coming out, this is good. But again, um, Sometimes too manufactured because people they don't know that when they see a film, nothing is real and everything is real in the end. Say say good morning and this tick 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 is in one track which didn't happen at the same time. The good morning is not the same time that you know is dubbed, and you know the 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 air and the the mosquito that <laughs> in the room is added and things like that. So. That's that. That's very nice when it happens and you make it. But it's really, you know, nothing is real. It's, it's nothing wrong that it's nothing is real. But it's, you know, sometimes it's funny. Yeah. I don't. I don't say that. Um, I don't. I, I didn't like. I mean, I don't like working on films and I have a, a bitter. Not at all. I mean, you know. And I've had a, a really problem with with any director. is is an experience, and it's an experience in many many ways. And it changed from from being alone and working alone. But what else I can say? Then we have to take film by film and go and mention things that they're not important. Anyway. Well, you might. I mean, you might give one example. I mean, you told me some very interesting stories about uh, Oliver and. And Alexander about <laughs> problems of going backwards and forwards there. And I thought that was quite interesting. Well, that was Oliver, and we had to, to go with it. I mean, you know, because the director is the director, and you know, he's his film, and his head is on stake, and you know, he has to take the decisions. And if he wants to change, you know, the scene twenty thousand times, he's going to change it. And Oliver is, is like this. And you know, we had you know a lot of laughter and you know good time and. You know, I don't dislike him. You know, we never had a, a fight. You know, things like that. I wasn't asking about your personal relationship. But one and a half years, we were going back and forwards. You know, <laughs> 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 doing the same thing and the same thing and the same thing all the time. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't asking, but I wasn't asking about the personal relationship, but just the, yeah. the actual process. I mean, the, the process. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know. No, it's 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 as you know, it's easy. You know, Alexander cost, you know, to me a few kilos, my engineer had a heart attack, you know, <laughs> things like that is good. <laughs> and the film was a, you know, it was not a failure. Um do you prefer working alone to this sort of collective enterprise, or do you feel you need someone to...? Let's say if you put the, word, the, the verb working, when I'm making a film, I'm working, and I'm working with other people. When I'm alone, I'm not working. Something happened completely different, which I can't call, I can't call work. It's more natural because, you know, it can happen any, any, any time of the day or of the night, or continuously, all the time. It's like breathing. 
Now, if breathing is working, then, then I'm working, yeah. As simple as that. But when I'm making a film, then yes, I can say I'm working. That's a project. And I'm part of this project and do my best. It's interesting that you compare what you do to breathing. It's breathing. It's simple breathing. And, and I say that because I don't know if you remember, I told you that I started so early and I never had anything preconceived in my mind about career, about what I'm going to become, what is going to be my job, things like that. You don't have when you are three or four years old. And that was breathing. So this is exactly the same thing I'm doing. The only thing is today I'm suffocating. <laughs> Instead of breathing because of all the, the things around. But if you know I'm not disturbed by all this silliness around, I'm breathing. And it's extraordinary because then, you know, the whole thing... Then sometimes if you say, oh yes, I heard this and I enjoy it very much. Uh, you know, you, you enjoyed it not because it's me that he did, I did it, because the way I did it, it was a healthy way. So it was maybe um, closer to the most natural way. And that's very, very important the natural birth, something that the baby doesn't suffer, doesn't get, you know, um, how you call it, uh, mistreated. It's something like that. The most natural something happens, the most, uh, the most um, natural, uh, you know, natural function can have. And then again here, we have another thing, which has been promoted, that artists have to suffer. And, and many, many times artists, especially dancers and things, they've been applauded when they suffer. More you, you uh, transpire, perspire, how you call it? Perspire. perspire on stage, more you get the applause. More the artists suffer, more the, the, the work is going to be incredible. You do something in five minutes, doesn't worth anything. The same thing, you spend maybe a week to do it or a month, becomes a masterpiece. Because this is, this is how the values have been, they've been uh, promoted to, to society. And I saw it many times. I believe that, uh, because I, I've been through that, that the calmer you are, uh, the less uh, um, disturbed you are, the better you can you can function, and you can function uh, in a very harmonious way. Is is this why um, I'm? Uh, I don't know quite know how to put it, but I mean, is this why you turned your back on the success of uh, Aphrodite's Child, for example, because of all the pressures that were building up, or? This wasn't no, the, I, I turn back. The, I, I turn back my my uh, my uh, myself to things like that only for one reason, not because I don't like what I'm doing. Because what I'm doing, I, I know why I'm doing it. When I'm talking, you know, in inside this uh, record business, it's because I don't like to, the monopoly of things. As I said to you, when you have the fortune and the misfortune to be successful, then it works both ways. And, and for me, it's very, very difficult. I can't, uh, due to, to the success, because the success is not the most important thing for me, to become a prisoner to the success and, and, be, and, and uh, being obliged to produce the same thing all the time. And that's why I'm turning my back to things like that. So I say, I have to move to something, I've done it, but I don't want to be obliged to do it. And uh, in this case, I've done it for two and a half years, and, and uh, we've been number one, record after record. That's okay. But then you have to move to something else, and you have all the systems says, no, 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 it's not possible. And this is my big question, that when I, when I decided to leave my country and to, to, uh, to go to England, and then, then at the same time we've been stopped in France for, for the 
political reasons, you know, May 68. Uh, I always, until today, ask myself if the right decision was to, to start like this. Of course, you know, in, in two months, the first records became, you know, huge number one, I mean, all, all over Europe. But that was the goal, it was not the, the essence, that was the, if you want, the, the, the mean, the, the, the way to do things. And then, you know, after that, you know, I find myself obliged to deliver the second number one. Big problem there. <laughs> and I did second number one. And then after second number one, I, I was obliged to, to deliver the third number one, which is even more difficult. And I delivered the third number one. Then, you know, it was more difficult to deliver the fourth number one, which I did again. And I say, look, I'm not here to deliver number ones, because that's a different job, and maybe there are other people that are starving for this. I'm not. So, um, yeah, that's it. And nothing against the number ones, of course. It's the way and the, the, the system that push you to do that. You know, Rain and Tears is a wonderful song. Right. Okay. You might not think I, I didn't, that. But I didn't, I didn't left my country in order to go and, and become a slave to Rain and Tears. That was one thing, you know, among many other things, that, you know. Why did you leave? Because uh, at that time, you know, um, I couldn't function in Greece technologically. It was very, very difficult. Uh, and I had to move. I felt that I had, to move, I had to move, you know, outside of Greece, which actually, for the moment, London was booming. You know, the, the whole... Uh, technological thing was much, much better studios and, and instruments and all that. And uh, I end up in France because, you know, a, you, you can't calculate those kind of things. Been, you know, we've been stopped there and we couldn't move. And we started the career from there. And then after that, you know, in uh, 74, I just moved to London, which I built my first studio. And that was my goal, to have my own studio in order to in one hand to collaborate with Reco Comics and the one hand in the other hand to be free to you know to function without asking permission and uh, you know the money in order to go to a studio and record and of course at the time the technology was different and uh, it's not like today the technology is much more flexible this kind of things in a in a small size it gets smaller in size at the time, technology, you know, you needed a big space in order to to have multi-tracks and things like that. Mm -hmm. So from 74 onwards, I just got my, my own place. And then that was, let's say, 50% I felt that I could move, you know, as much as I wanted in my own place. And the other 50% I've been working in order to, you know, <laughs> to support the place and all the technology, and to finance the whole thing. Yeah. This was the big always fight. It always is a fight. Yeah. Why don't we have a break? Pea break. 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 Oh, it's very interesting. I mean, um, yeah, you're not being negative. I mean, My eyes are raining, or you are swimming, or <laughs> so I have, I have to. Do you want to have a thought about money? Yeah. That makes the fucking difference, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. That's all. Um, this one of them, I've got. Focus on me, you see, you do what I mean. He's just checking my Maui. See? Because of the light. Okay. So, this we're, is light. We'll, we'll, we'll plant a little paint job when we get back to the studio. No, we can... Mm. We fix it in post. We fix it. We'll no, fix you can't. You can't fix it. Oh, you can. You can fix the iPad. You can do it. No, but uh, no, no, you see me, uh, now, that, now that we fix the monitor, look, if you just, get, just hold your hand still. Uh, hold your hand still. Look, you see, that I couldn't see before. Not yeah. We in that. So we have to throw away the other thing. No, no. But we can salvage it. Hmm. <laughs> Once did a very... No, I think we've been crossed. 
And at the end, he got up and he said, he said, well, I, that was really interesting. I enjoyed that. Is any of it salvageable? <laughs> yeah. That's good. Excellent. Very good. Very silly question, uh, yes. because it is such a grand, it's such a big question. What, 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 a lot of what you say sounds yes. as if you have a, a, a view of the world which you want to try and persuade others of. Um, not force them, but through education, as you rightly say, to enlighten people. Not really enlighten, just just a little bit, just stop a little bit and think. That's all. Thought is a little bit, you know, it's uh, like uh, banned today, like forbidden. They don't they don't let you time to think. Because you know you have to do go very quickly to do things, or because you have so many problems, you just no no time to think. And we do things because we do things without thinking. Just think a little bit. Just stop. A little bit, just a touch. That will help. And also, what you know, I don't, I don't try to say nothing to the, to to anybody, because it's wrong. To teach things is wrong. To to uh, to uh, convince people is wrong. What is uh, maybe the um, the only thing I can say? The only thing I can say is. Uh, Try to be objective as much as possible. That's all. Because being objective, then you can cure a lot of problems. Just being objective. I don't say be kind or be clever or be whatever. Be objective. I mean, it's not easy, but it will save us. It will save a lot of problems by being the objectivity. Every, everything has been so subjective. You know what I mean? Society is subjective. Everything leads to subjectivity. It's an enormous difference. Enormous difference. So try to be, I'm not saying be, I try to be objective. Uh, you can really, uh, we, everybody, can, can uh, become better. We, we can understand a lot of things. We can change a lot of things immediately. Immediately. I don't know if you agree, but uh, I'm not trying to convince anybody. By convincing, you don't do anything. Convincing for other societies and for other things. To try to convince people for things. I'm not to convince anything. Why? I don't have the right to do that. But try to, to say, be objective. I'm, I have the right to do that. To say that. Ten minutes, I thought. Which question? I've got one more question. Now the monitor is sorted out. Okay. Mm -hmm. What I was going to say before. We... Sorry. Before we were so rudely interrupted, um, I know you won't think of it in these terms, but but I. What would you say your job was? I think I never had a job. I never felt 
that I'm doing a job. Although, yes, I mean, you know, it just, as I say, when I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm writing, you know, music for a film, I can consider that as a job. Or maybe, I don't know what, something else. But in general terms, I never felt that. I never felt I'm a musician, actually. I mean, I, they call me musician, they call me composer. I don't know what that means. I don't know, I never, I never knew. I know, of course, what that means, but I mean, I never felt it like that. As much as I never felt that I'm a painter. And I don't know why, through the years, I keep exactly the same feeling. Since day one. Because it's natural for me. It's just natural the way that I breathe and I live and... And um, maybe a job is when you try to do something in order to get some money uh, for the reasons, the practical reasons and needs in life. But, uh, but uh, you know, for me, uh, music uh, is, it was not something separate or painting. It was just the whole thing like that, and at the same time, I was always, and I am interesting in uh, in uh, research and science in science. I always ask myself, why this, why that, why that, why that, and I, you know, the the most answers I took them from memory or from nature itself. If you know how to read those kind of things, and if you you have the ability to remember, all the rest are you know external information. Something to happen today for you, that happens today more and more. Young people they have every information they need, but um, do they have the knowledge? Information is one thing; knowledge is another. And information doesn't come, sorry, knowledge doesn't come out of information uh, automatically. Something else has to, to, to work there, you know, which is your, your brain. So I thought you were going to say, which, which is, would, would reflect absolutely what you said earlier, that, as you said, young people through the internet and other things have all the information out there. Just More than they need. But no memory. No, of course they don't That's need. The, yeah, because everything is there. I mean, memory works in different ways. To memorize things and to remember things, what you've done 10 years ago, or maybe to, to, to have the memory of maybe 20,000 books that you wrote. That's one kind of memory. But there's another memory, is the, the biological memory, which actually contains all the, the codes and the secrets the, of the universe itself, the, all the, the mechanisms of, of the system, which actually is, is too far away from us now, because we, we, we've been through this hypnosis, uh, through this, uh, how you call it, uh, like a hibernation. We don't work, I mean, every, uh, people say we, we use 10% of our brain. Conditioning. Yeah, and no more. And the question is, we're using 10% is going to be 20, or it's been 100 and now it's 10%? Somebody has to answer that question. He went down to 20%, he's going from 10% up to whatever it's going to be. Maybe the contrary, maybe we, we end up using maybe 1% of the brain now. And the momentum of this... Uh, uh, this, uh, you know, losing our our ability to to, to to think properly, it's it's promoted. It's not uh, the most dangerous thing today. It's that you have this explosion, enormous expl explosion of technology, and the enormous you know, uh, momentum of, uh, you know, uh, dumbing down situation. I mean, you have uncivilized people, you have uh, uneducated people more and more in general, but at the same time, they have access to the most dangerous technology every day more and more. So what do you have with this? You have something unbelievable. 
And this is, to me, is enormous, enormous danger. Enormous. I don't want to think what can happen. Because the, instead of those kind of things, you know, to, to, to get together, they, they go apart. How we can manage humans to always to end up like that, I don't know. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. And again, you know, that's not a very nice thing to say, but we said it. You don't, you don't sound very optimistic about the human condition. I'm optimistic because whatever happens, I, I, you know, I keep doing what I'm doing, irrespective of what I'm saying. But uh, being objective and uh, as as accurate as it can be, I can say no. I mean, things are not very. I don't know if you agree or disagree, but this is what, uh, what my feeling is. But, you know, I don't... Oh, I, I would be much um, harsher than you. Hmm. I mean, I take... I mean, since you brought the example up uh, of plastic surgery, I mean, that, that, that plastic surgery to me has always seemed the perfect um, example of a decline in any, any moral guiding principle. If you can simply change the physical appearance of things to what you think is better, and actually frequently, as we know, turns out to be something unspeakably hideous, um, then in the end you're saying that only the, and I'm not saying just plastic surgery happens to only to the face, but only the face value of something yeah. has any value. And we know yeah. that's not the case. Yeah. So I mean I find that I find that Really, pes I mean, a really pessimistic view. And if we can do that now with reasonable success, even if occasionally a monster appears at the end, a Frankenstein appears at the end, then it's going to get progressively. We're going to go progressively down that as this sort of vacuous idea of personality and vanity, True. as you quite rightly said, becomes more and more crucial. But again, and politicians, for example, yeah. it matters more how they appear on television than yeah. what they're actually saying. Exactly. And it happens like that because some people they vote for for the president. I don't say which president because no, they, they, they like the, the face of the other. They prefer the other one, but the other one had a better look. Well, you see the thing. The thing is that we we say this and that and the other, and we try to analyze. But it's one maybe another way to to find out the, the solution is to, um, how you call it, how, when, when you go for, um, to the hospital in order to, to examine you and to, to have the, how you call this? Um, the analysis. Not the analysis, but the doctor says the, you know, the... Um, <coughs> oh, diagnosis. Diagnosis. Right, that was a Greek word, and I lost it because you know. And when the diagnosis, now the diagnosis is so important as much as is the what I said before the to be as much as possible um, objective. Now the thing that we don't do is the diagnosis that we we don't do the the, the right diagnosis for for what's happening. And if you don't do the, 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 the right diagnosis, we can't treat the symptom. Because what we do here, we're talking about symptoms all the time. This symptom is not good, this symptom doesn't happen like that, this symptom, you know, it's like this. You know, all symptoms. But the causes, in order to find the cause, you have to diagnose the cause. And there is something that people, either they're not able to go, or maybe they don't dare going. And if you don't go to this, it's nothing that can change. And the change is not against uh, no, no one. The change is only for humanity. It's humanity on stake. It's not one country or another. It's humanity itself on stake. This is 
how we get, I mean, as far as we get now. And we're not able to realize that. We can't realize, somehow, the human brain can't realize this. And that is something incredible. But we talk about terrible symptoms, 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 symptoms. You say, I can't sleep at night, I have pain here in my head, I can't move my head, I have pain in my back. Okay, why? Let's find the why. Nobody does. I mean, and sometimes on television, late at night, they have some problems. And then, then some uh, semi uh, pseudo intellectuals, they say some totally, you know, <laughs> stupid things. And they go into political things and they try through that to promote certain other stupid ideas. And then, you know, it gets even worse. And then they, they mix up the people that they can listen. But fortunately, you know, two or three o'clock in the morning, nobody listens, so it's okay. <laughs> but, you know, the right diagnosis, and as much as it's, it's um, objective you can be, I think that can lead you somehow, somewhere, that maybe you can start having a hope of something. Otherwise, all the teachings, all the systems, and all the things won't help you. Pursuing the Greek uh, connection, I mean, music was for the Greeks part of that healing process. Oh, definitely. So I think I go back to what is your job? It's almost quasi physician, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's music, yes, has something <laughs> really special to give us. That's First of all, my ancestors believe, and I believe, said, I mean, they never believed, actually. They knew it was... Uh, ancient Greece was for knowledge, not for belief. Belief started through the Christian years. Everything went through, through knowledge. And through the knowledge said that uh, uh, going to, you know, to the, medical, the medical stuff is art. Music is science. Now, this sounds odd today. If you if you're going to analyze if you're going to analyze this because that is not the point today and I can tell you 100 percent that they're right they're not wrong. It doesn't matter if I'm going to analyze it now or not. Definitely, music is science. It's mother of sciences. Now, why all these years never been that? Because it's never been treated like this. Because everything changed. Because don't forget that for centuries we couldn't have access to any of the books of science, philosophy, mathematics, uh, academies, closed everything, burnt everything. People that try to say something, they've been put to fire. You remember that. You remember, of course we remember, all we remember. You know, we've never been lived at that time. But through all those years it's been a destruction and and, and they banned knowledge. And suddenly today, you know, for X reasons, you know, for the last maybe 150 years, this big booming of, of technology and science, of course. But with not the other thing we said before, which is education. And now we're producing a very, very dangerous human being. And then all those kind of things, because we're talking about control before, how you control things, by controlling the senses and all that, that these things are very primitive ways, according, I mean, to, to, to this, uh, you know, um, how you call it? Um, um, Somebody's name? No, no. Mm. To is a medical thing. The but not back to diagnosis. No, the engineering. The uh, oh, uh, genetic engineering. Genetic. The genetic engineering. All that they want. They want. According, you know, it sounds like less science fiction, but it's going to be done in advance. Why you try? I mean, to educate people, or you know, to, to people who don't have to go to school and things like that. You can prepare all these things before. What people do you want? There are companies that can produce people like this or like that, like that. And then everything is fine. Blade Runner. It's Blade Runner. Although it sounds still science, science, uh, science fiction. 
But we see it every day more and more and more and more. Right? There's no point for the Olympics. You won't have people to, to jump maybe 10 meters, you know, or maybe, uh, I don't know, to, to run 100 meters in three seconds is possible. We made them. We can make them. Everything is possible to make. Everything is possible to control. Because if the problem is controlling, and if we have new means to control people, why not use them? The thing is that, do we want to control? We, we shouldn't uh, start reacting once we've been controlled. We have to be reacted if we should or we shouldn't control. Once we do it, we are controlled, then it's too late. So within that rather, um, within that scenario, yeah, what is the, the Blade Runner scenario. <laughs> what, is, what is the function of music? The function of music always has been biological. It's, it was being, it was the best, the best uh, language to reach the soul and to get and to you know to definitely not to harm people, to make a better per to make you a better person. And that is the, the music, the, the contact uh, to, uh, of the music to the people. And also the function of music for the scientific side is through that to understand the universe, the, fun the, the mechanism of the universe and the laws of the universe, because it's exactly the same thing. So the universe never harm anybody. We harm ourselves. We, we are destructive. The universe is changing. We, we, do, uh, we cause destruction every day by imposing things, by uh, you know, interfering all the time. It's completely different. But this, for, me, for me, music has, has these two functions. And none of these functions happen today. Music has always been uh, uh, a vehicle in order to create artists, some very, some great, to create, you know, to some kind of pleasure, of course. Uh, you know, in, in, in Greek we have two words. Uh, I don't know if you have them in English. They're completely different. We say διασκέδαση και ψυχαγωγία. The first one means when you you get something and you you know just uh, you feel okay and you laugh and all that. You have a good time. And the other one has to do with your soul, which is much deeper and more serious which doesn't happen today. The first one happens really everywhere. But the second thing, no. But I can't find the words in English right now, although they might exist in order to, you know, to... to say it. You know, that is very hard for me to go into deep waters like this with a few English that I'm, you know, I'm using. Very difficult, very difficult, because you need really to, to, you know, to um, use the language in a proper way, and much more efficient way than I do it. And I'm, I'm doing it. You're not doing too badly. Ah. You're not doing too badly. Let's stop then. We stop here immediately. <laughs> Fascinating conversation to come up from this side of the table. I'm happy to talk all night, but I don't want to tie you up. This is a proof of harmony. Look at that. Yeah. No. Now, if it's not harmonious, it will fall. True or not? Yeah. See, look at that. No disturbance is going around. If I disturb it, finish. And this is what we're doing every day. Send it.
perfect. And scientifically, of course, you can explain why that happens, why that happens. Felix, go right into a big uh, close-up of the spinning top. As long as I don't disturb it, it will it will turn as much as the first. Uh, do it, do it once more. Yeah. Ooh, it's coming this way now. <laughs> you want to do it again? No, just keep keep it a bit closer to you because of the focus. And the incredible thing is that now you have this friction here, but if there's no friction and space, it will turn forever. Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh. Let's spin it once more. Yeah. Uh, Fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. Keep it in the middle, Philip. In the middle. Keep it in the middle, keep it in the middle. Don't touch it. Leave it until it dies. Yeah. Thank you very much again. A lot was said there. No, I'm going to have a Make, make it close, as you see. A close up. Yeah. Good. I've never been so beautiful in my life, my entire life. It's a bit closer than we would. From want. now on, you're going to be my hairdresser, you, you, Felix. You can definitely go. You have to hear it when you. Yeah, but the, the wide angle is very nice. Okay, there you go. George, you're right. What is wrong? What is here? What do I have here? Glasses. Excuse me. I'll put this. Can I put it here? Okay, you agree? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's on that side. this. What's that? Sorry. You alright? Yeah. Lovely? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, you've just thrown me into complete confusion by showing these wonderful photographs of you as a little boy, especially this one. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, that, you have lots of memories of that. Yeah. That was my first piano. My first friend, real friend. 
The funny, you know, the, the funny thing about that is that I don't remember. I just found myself. I remember myself sitting on the piano, but I never remember how I started. Which means that I had, I have to start. I had to start very, very early. I never, I never, you know, because most of the times people say, "Oh yes, we had the piano," and at the age of I don't know, five or six or ten. You know, I took some lessons and, you know, I started playing the piano. But I don't remember that. I remember sitting there. And that must be between three and four. And, you know, spent hours and hours playing. It was good because it was not an upright piano. So it was not claustrophobic. It just had the view. <laughs> yeah. And as you see in the picture, you know, I, I, at that age, you know, I'm, I'm grown up. I must be 80 years old here. But I mean, four years before that, I couldn't reach the pedals. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm quite older. I mean, it's... <laughs> yes. And I think it must be Christmas, because I can see behind a little Christmas tree. I don't know if you see it. Oh, yeah. 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 I asked you when, I, when you produced this, I said, do you have lots of memories of this house? And you said, oh, yes, lot. Tell yes. Where, where it is. Well, it's not anymore. It's just, yeah. just no... Where was it then? Was it? Was it at Volos, which is a town by the sea. Marvellous at the time, beautiful town with a lot of houses like that. And a lot of gardens and flowers. Because this... this uh, Place it's uh, at you know at, uh, at Pelion near Pelion. Pelion it's uh, it's this mountain, the mythological mountain of the centaurs. And this mountain is known because of the vegetation. It's a lot of green. Actually, this mountain enters you know into it's like a croissant into the sea. And. Uh, into the Aegean Sea, and you have seen both sides. And this is, which is incredible, because in this area, I mean, you can feel, you can feel the uh, the seasons. You can feel the winter, very very heavy winter, with snow on the top. You can feel the autumn, which is extraordinary. From you know the the, the, the colors, the pastel colors. You can uh, feel uh, the summer, of course. And the spring, which is, I mean, you, you can faint from, from, from the, 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 the aroma, all the flowers, extraordinary. And I had, you know, this chance to grow up uh, in the middle of, of this uh, um, extraordinary um, changes of, of seasons. Is it, it's on, that's on Crete. No, it's it's Volos. It's in the middle of Greece, uh, about uh, maybe almost two hundred miles from Athens, north by the sea. It's a very mythological place, actually. Now, of course, it changed a lot because the through the years, of course, you know, this, the constructions changed, the new architecture, and. Um, also because uh, we've been hit, it, uh, we had a big problem with earthquakes uh, during mid-50s, mid something like that, and, and uh, a lot of the houses have been destroyed. Uh, but the characteristic of this town is that uh, you had houses like that and a lot of gardens and a lot of flowers and trees, which is, you know, a paradise for a child. And for this this reason, I was very fortunate to to grow up my first years in in in, in a area like that in a you know situation like this. I think that helped me later a lot. And then I, I left after the earthquakes and I moved to Athens, which actually my parents left Athens during the war because. Uh, during the war, uh, the, the Second World War, the uh, <clears throat> people in Athens uh, died from hunger. Uh, the, it was a t 
terrible situation. And many people, I mean, in order to, to survive, left Athens and they, you know, they went to, to villages, to, to places that they could find a little food. And, and my grandfather used to earn an, a lot of land and he had a lot of things, I mean, um, bread, fruits, oil, olives, things uh, that could survive. I mean, that's why my family survived. My, my, my mother, my father survived like this because of my grandfather. And, um, and then after I was born there, I was born in a village actually, outside of Vols, outside of this, this, uh, this is not the house I was born. This is the house that uh, I grew up. <coughs> and a few years later, at the age of maybe some nine, ten years old, we moved back to Athens, where my f parents came from. That's it. Because Simple. There, I was going to say there are a lot of uh, there are an awful lot of CDs that deal with nature. Interestingly enough. Yeah. Uh, whether the sea or the sky or <laughs> whatever. I mean. Well, I had a, a, a overdose of that when I was a child. Overdose of smells and things. Yeah. It's really a springtime. It's, it's unbearable. It's so strong. It's unbearable. It smells. I mean, the, 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 the aroma of the flowers is unbelievable. Still now, still with the, with the new construction, it's, it's, you, can, you can see that although the, the, you know, this town has been, you know, somehow not the same change. Although uh, there have been all these changes, the town kept uh, somehow the, the, you know, the, the, the same character. Mm -hmm. Not exactly the same, but you can see that it's, it's a very special place. Sometimes I go. I visit, I mean, two years ago, I started going back for all since my childhood. Because, I mean, most of the time, so you, you just say, you know, I travel a bit away and so on. But of course, now, the, 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 the place of that house is a, is, is a, <laughs> a big, you know, six, seven store building. Completely changed. Why did you say that the, you felt the piano was your friend? My only friend is actually what you said. No, my yeah, at the beginning, you know, when uh, maybe because it was my friend in areas that other friends couldn't be. I used to go out and play with my friends of the same age, and uh, but uh, spend my time with the piano. That was a different conversation because I had in front of me the sound. Although it was not the same sound, the same, the, 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 it was not the only sound because I, could, I, I, I used to produce sound with all the objects of the house, especially the kitchen stuff. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Concerto for saucepan. Yeah, yeah, I, I used to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to, I mean, use the glasses and water and change the pitch and and the, all the pants of my mother, and all, all the time like that. I think that, you know, my mother, she was quite, uh, quite good. I mean, she, uh, she never really been angry or something, because I used to, to break some. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, I think that, that, I think, you know, my first years, uh, the, I always remember, I think I had the chance to have good, Good starting, good years, very good. Although it was a very difficult period after the war for Greece, like everywhere. But I don't think I felt that because of maybe of my parents and maybe of the place itself. Because the civil war was. Um Raging, but yeah, and I'm talking actually after the civil war because oh. the civil war again yeah, is started. It just lasted for for a few years. I don't I don't really remember that it was too early for me. When I start remembering, it was 
after the Civil War. Yeah, in Greece it was really uh, in a very in a terrible state. But of course, being you know four or five years old, you don't really feel those kind of things. Mm. Especially when you are surrounded, you know, you live in a house like that and you have good parents and they take care of you. Those kind of things that don't reach you, that maybe some other children had a terrible time. Have you got a, a favourite memory of, of either your mother or your father? <sighs> favourite memory? Sitting in the garden, eating with some neighbours and friends from around because this garden was full of flowers and trees. And uh, sitting with my mother and... Uh, because, you see, <laughs> my mother used to, to play the piano and sing from, you know, classical stuff, leader, and she was, you know, she was a, a, used to accompany her, herself. And uh, because I had a good ear, I, I just remember those things and I would play with her and, and, uh, and even with a little accordion sometimes because I couldn't carry the, the piano outside in, the, in the, the garden. And then I had this little accordion my uncle bought for me and I used to accompany my, my mother when she used to sing some, you know, nice, beautiful songs, some ballads and things like that. I remember those, those, those moments. Very, very nice. And then, bang, suddenly had to leave because, you know, after the earthquakes, I left immediately. I had a shock and they couldn't, I couldn't stay there anymore. And we moved to Athens and then, you know, They're obviously a very um, powerful influence on you, your parents. Uh, the influence I had from my, from my parents is that uh, they, never, they never interfered. They, they, they just leave me alone, leave me to be. Of course they interfere like all the parties that try, you know, the best and, you know, you know, put something on, don't, you shouldn't catch a cold or you have to go to school and you have to wake up in the morning and things like that. I mean, the usual stuff, but I never, <clears throat> I never had uh, any, any more than that. Because after all, I spend my time with the piano, with painting, with uh, doing all sorts of things with my hands, constructing things, you know, always, always. I used to, actually, I remember I used to, um, to make my own, bows and arrows yeah and I still I still have a, a great collection of bows and arrows even now I mean I, I I love archery since you know my childhood and then there I had a lot of room to do that <laughs> yeah well, I don't know why I'm saying to you all those things <clears throat> It's, you know, uh, archery is a very physical, and uh, I'm not talking about hunting. No, no, no. I'm talking about target. Yeah. And I still have the same interest and the same pleasure when I'm shooting with a, with a bow, an arrow. Did uh, your parents? Hmm? Tape? I was going to say, um, your parents must have lived long enough to see your success. My father, yes, not my mother. My mother died soon after I left Greece. And uh, she never had the time. Because, I mean, when you, you are successful, I think it's very important for your parents more than for yourself. Because they, all parents, you know, they feel very proud and they take great pleasure when where the son or daughter 
makes it some, somehow, somewhere. And uh, when we had the first uh, success, uh, big success in France, at exactly at that time, I've been waiting for her to, to visit me in Cannes, in France, south of France. And uh, suddenly she died. And that was, you know, a terrible thing, because I know that parents die some, somehow, sometime, but I think she, she died at the wrong time, <laughs> wrong moment. It was, very, it was a really terrible blow for me. But my father lived through the Paris years and through the London years, uh, until the chariots of fire. And then he died, you know, just a little bit before I got the Oscar. He would have been great for my father, of course. You know, every, everything has been calculated like this. There's nothing I can do about it. But you obviously miss them very much, still. Yes, I do. I do. Because I can't, I can't, uh, which is really a very good thing for, for, for me, I can't have negative memories about them. S some other friends of mine or children, they had terrible memories about their, their, their parents, which happens all the time. But I never had that. I had a very nice, very good childhood and great, great people. I, I really... I'm really very, very lucky to have parents like that. Object, uh, objectively, I'm talking about. Well, you can't talk about your parents objectively. I mean, oh no, no, I, yeah, no, because I mean, I would have said yes. I mean, I love them, but they've been like this or like yeah, that. And but I can't, I can't, I can't find something negative to say about them. Even if I try very hard, I can't find anything. Yeah. Now we're talking about very personal things. Nobody, nobody wants to know about those kind of things. You're wrong. <laughs> Depends. Yeah. Depends. No, I mean the child is father of the man in every sense. I think. Excuse me. The child is father of the man in every sense. Yeah. We are what our parents made us: good, bad, and indifferent. Yeah, yeah. Well, this part of my life has been a very nice part, you know, very, you know, harmonious. Well, and later, you know, the, the, the real stuff started, you know, there are, yeah. But I mean, I sense about you that in spite of your understandable um, I don't, is unhappiness the right word? Unhappiness about some of the things which you've had to encounter and you've had to deal with. That your instinct always seems to me, ever since I've known your instinct, is to try and find the, the goodness in the situation rather than automatically think of the badness of the situation, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. That has to have come from somewhere. And this this idyllic childhood which you're describing clearly is yeah. the fountain of that, I think. Possibly, because I never heard my parents, uh, you know, criticize and talk about bad about other people. They've been very generous. We had a, our house was a very open house to everybody. Very generous people. No, no, no misery, no, no, you know, how, how can I explain? Uh, no negativity. Uh, I don't know, I don't remember, I mean, negative things in the house. Which is a very rare situation. Mm. That you, don't, you don't have that. And they've been through difficult times, as I said, because, it, I mean, although I, I didn't understand at the time, later I understood that they've been through, you know, through hell. I mean, there's been a war and, and, and a civil war. But they made it such a way that... that uh, Nothing of those things touch anybody of us, my brother and myself. 
Yeah. Yeah. What else? I don't know what else to say. I mean. <laughs> all those memories they go so fast in my 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 mind and by the time maybe I want to say one thing it's another come <laughs> <laughs> it's always the case yeah but I think the the, the conversations to poetry that you have with your pots and pans and your even your piano is uh, mm. yes I I mean I used to actually with this piano you can imagine I still have this piano and uh, I used to open the piano. My, my, my mother was a little bit worried, but I, was open, I used to open the piano and uh, do things that, you know, in musical terms, we call prepare piano today. It's like adding things in bet between the strings and things like that, metal things or other things, in order to create sounds and to, to, uh, to obtain things that a piano, a normal piano like this doesn't doesn't do. I mean, and and uh, by creating the sounds, which actually, for my mother, it was quite uh, extraordinary and quite strange. For me, it was a wonder because I used to obtain incredible things out of the piano. And then another thing I used to do, I used to to go under the piano, especially when my mother used to play, and. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I was so impressed to hear the sound coming from above, and hit my head, boop, 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 like that, and under the piano it was my little, little house, <laughs> with some toys, and that was really a very safe place to be. You know, when an upright piano you can't do that with, a, with a piano. How you call it with yeah. a grand piano? It's, it's really much easier to do that, and that. I remember this little, little, um, like cave under the piano it was incredible. Yeah. Like a kind of private place, really. Yeah, yeah. It, for the child, I mean, when you are four years old, you can, you can fit under the piano. It's a lot of room. It's great. I mean, I remember things like that. And then back to my bows and arrows, and then back to the piano. Um, yeah. <laughs> that has to be the source of the happiness. I don't know. But I mean, there are some people who have that, that kind of idyllic um, childhood, and they then feel that really hasn't prepared them for the bows and arrows that come in later life, if you see what I mean, inevitably come in later life. Do you know? Do you see what I mean? Mm. They can't believe that people can be as nasty as that, or can be as aggressive as that, or can be as dishonest as that, because that they've been protected in a, in a loving way, but in a way that yeah. has not prepared them for the awfulness of most of. But the f the funny thing is that uh, parallel to this situation which I try to describe as, as a very nice and, uh, and velvet and, you know, harmonious thing. Uh, somehow, I, I started very early, uh, very early to start to ask questions. Why this, why that, about the universe, about where the music comes from. Uh, quite scientific for my age about matter, antimatter, uh, about, uh, you know, the galaxies, about uh, a lot of things. And, and my mind couldn't stop, you know, working like this, thinking like that. Very, very early age. And that was not... Uh, I, I don't say that it was uneasy, but uh, it took me out of this... Uh, um, child way of thinking. Very early, very very early. And I was doing that, especially not when I was playing the piano, but when I was hitting a ball 
in one of the walls, in the, in the, you know, the, the garden walls of the house, and having, like a squash, having the ball coming at me and hitting the ball, and have the ball coming back and hitting the ball. And all this time, all, all my brain was going, used to go, uh, you know, through space, through the planets, through the system, through the, the, uh, the music, you know, uh, of the spheres. Because I remember the time they, they used to ask me, I mean, where the music comes from? So I would say, from, from above. Already I was, now, now I'm saying that I understand now, at the time, I remember what I was saying, and maybe it's that because from the early days I was, you know, somehow geared, to, you know, to, to, to think like that until today. That's why maybe I never thought music as an art or music as a career. I didn't know what a career means. I still, I don't know what the career means in, uh, still until now. I mean, maybe career means to do things that the others wants you, wants you to do, but not, not yourself. And uh, the funny thing is that I kept the same approach from my early days. And maybe this is the most important thing that I have to say more than I grew up in a garden and, you know, the flowers and all that, that's all, all good. But as I'm talking now, I realize that, you know, nothing changed from those days. It's exactly the same. Exactly, exactly, exactly the same. Same approach, same questions. Some answered, some unanswered. You know. And the most important thing is that I keep the same track. Same interests, always the why. <laughs> I ask a question, I have the answer, and I say why, and then <laughs> that produces another answer, and I say why again, and this and the other. So, I mean, th this is what I'm doing now with my friends from NASA. We 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 talk, we talk and talk and talk, and we we have boards and we write things and we talk about the universe and and all the systems and this is why this and why that and why this and why. And same thing, four or five years old, I was doing the same. Which means that when chi a child does that, it means that he's interested in that. Because nobody told me, nobody said to me, do the music or think about the universe or think, never. That, that was, and I think, by, by think, analyzing that, that this is, this is due to the memory. Is what I call memory, mm -hmm. memory, memory all the time. <sighs> yeah. And of course, the sounds uh, from everywhere that you know gets even the sound of, of the earthquake, which is incredible, incredible. Very low sound and and, you know, strong. Yeah. I will never, I will never forget this. These are really, you know, engraved in my, <laughs> my memory. I mean, for, for want of a, a better description, I mean, they are in effect natural sounds. Now, the natural sounds yeah. that we hear must have been the same sounds that Always, beings, always. That heard yeah. 10,000 years ago. The yeah. same sounds. 10, 20, 30, 100, whatever. Yeah, those sounds. Thousands years. Changed. Those sounds exactly the same. But finally, enough talking about sounds. Something that I said it, in, you know, in the few interviews that they gave in my life, it's that although the natural, natural sounds are these sounds, and then even we included the, all the instruments, that the human being produced, like you know, the the flutes, the harps, the violins, the you know, <coughs> the sorry, the um, percussions and all that, the acoustic, as we we call instruments, um, we call them natural sounds. I still believe that that the the electronic sounds are equally natural. 
the only thing that's changed is the source. And somehow even they go further than the acoustic instruments because you can produce sounds uh, closer to the, the sounds the, the, the sounds of the universe. I mean, human beings express themselves through the acoustics, acoustic instruments that we know today. But these instruments, they have limitations as well. They don't have limitations of the expression of feeling, but, 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 but they have limitations of sound. And I guess that's why we produce the symphony orchestra, because it's like the first synthesizer. It's something that we, we put together, the different uh, areas of sound together, and then we create colors and, uh, and situations between those, those different families of sound. And then you have the symphony orchestra. Otherwise, why having a symphony orchestra? It was a need to have that in order to enrich, enlarge the, the, the spectrum. But with the electronic instruments, you go even further than that. And why not? Why, why they're not natural? I mean, the whole universe is electricity. It's, uh, what's the name? Uh, it's waves. It's, it's, Okay, we shouldn't go to that now. But, uh, <laughs> no. So I don't. I don't really make the the distinction. We say yeah. between between the acoustic and electronic instruments. To me, are sources of sound. The only difference is that the acoustic instruments they give you the opportunity to express certain things, which the electronics you have to really with a lot of trouble to get there because the um, the playability is not the same. It's much more difficult and the way that it's been the, the design of the instruments until today is such that it doesn't give you the same uh, the same um, facility and subtlety, subtlety that a violin can give you. But I think we're getting there, you know. I've been, you know, fighting all the years in order to, for this combi companies to produce a proper electronic sound, uh, sorry, a proper electronic instrument. And unfortunately, maybe from the sound point of view, they're getting better, but from the playability point of view, they're getting worse. But this is another another area, another discussion. The fact is that the. The two, the two instruments, the two uh, kinds of, of approaches are equally important. And uh, I think that for, this, for the first time is no limit to what we can do from the sound point of view, because I think we cover the whole spectrum. Before, before we, we couldn't do that. We should talk about this when, we're, when you're sitting with your yeah. console tomorrow. Yeah. The, just one little thing, uh, for example, so you would say that when you make the choir hmm. on your console, that's, from a tonal point of view, the equivalent of the choir when you have a big choir, as you did in the 30th, for example. This is only when you want to produce something, uh, and which actually you can do it uh, with synthesis, or you can do it by sampling. But this is if you want to reproduce uh, a human voice, which actually now you can do that very, very well, or you can imitate uh, an already existing instrument. That's one approach. But it's another, another thing that you can create sounds which they don't... They don't um, uh, you know... My, uh, they have no connection to any of the existing instruments. They're completely new. I mean, it's nothing new in nature, but new from the ones that we 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 know. I mean, something that doesn't doesn't um, uh, sound like any other conventional. I mean, acoustic instrument. This is very interesting. And also because you can reproduce also the the acoustic instruments, which. 
but the, on the other hand, instead of doing that, you can you can have a, just a, a musician that play X acoustic instrument, and you have the same result. But uh, I think that uh, in that sense, we we live in a very interesting period. And this is something that, going back to my childhood, I predicted. Because I remember the fact that I'm, I don't read and write music until today. The, all my parents and some other people say, but why you don't, want, why you don't uh, learn how to read music? And, uh, and my answer as a child was, why I should do that? I mean, I don't need it. And uh, after all, I would like to, you know, I, I see music in a different way. And uh, if I want to, to write something or to read something, I mean, not to read, but to write something, there are going to be machines to do that. <laughs> you know, I, I said that when I was five or six years old, right? And then later I was saying that there are going to be instruments that they're going to produce other things. I mean, I knew it was going to happen. Although I never, you know, I never had the chance to, you know, in my early age to, to, to have things like this, like a child has today. I mean, today, a five-year-old kid is, you know, in front of him, he has an enormous amount of, 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 of sources of sound, incredible amount. I, I, I didn't have anything apart my kitchen stuff and my piano. But that's good as well, because from there I just uh, really squeeze the most out of, 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 of each object to get the, the thing I wanted. And to, learn, and to learn, as I said to you before, the, the character of the object by listening to, to his music, to his sound, to know the, to know the, 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 the object uh, the best way possible, not by looking at it, by by ha go inside and have the sound of it, the juice, which I still do today. I go to shop, for example, I start ding ding banging everything, and I can have people, you know, <laughs> looking at me. But dear. <laughs> That will never change, because imagine. this is the only way I know. <laughs> I can imagine shopping with you is fun. <laughs> ah, but it is, and I do it many times. When I'm really? interested in something, I go to ding. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I try to see, you know, if nobody look at me and you know just hit it, and I know immediately. What I can't say, I can't describe it because that's a different language. But I know inside me, I know exactly with what object I'm dealing with. <laughs> Maybe sounds crazy, but it's true. I'm doing it. Going back to the, the childhood, I mean, yes, I know it's a, a sort of cliche, but how how would you? Yes, how would you want someone to think of? <sighs> I never thought about it. I, mean, I was thinking of the little girl um, who famously said, you know, I like the paintings, is the music any good or whatever it was. Oh, the... Yeah, do you, you know, that one. I mean, how, how would you like people to think of you? Maybe, I don't know. I mean, I have to... I never thought about it. I just maybe try to think something now to tell you. Maybe um, that whatever I did, I never tried to harm anybody. And I never tried to impose anything. And uh, because, you know, I don't want people to impose anything on me. And um, I think that I'm a great believer in, in, um, in freedom. And uh, to be, I mean, in a real sense, to be free. Not, not I mean, there are many different uh, ways to, to say that, but... Uh, not to harm anybody, not to harm people, that's all. I mean, I, I don't like... 
I would like to say, okay, I mean, you know, I know Vangelis, he never did something bad for me. No more than that. I think that's more important than... Because really, and if, if I did, and if I... If, it would, maybe it happened without me knowing or understand. I mean, just not because I never tried you know, to harm anybody. I think that's extremely important. Very, very important. Other than that, I don't know what else I can say. Because I never, since, as I said, since the beginning, I never aimed, I never had a plan of careers and things like that. You know, to to be famous or to be successful, or, you know. Maybe the, these are tools for other things, but they should never be tools to, you know, to, to change your soul. Be successful is a good tool for communication, but then once you communicate, you have to, to know what to say to people. <laughs> very, very responsible job. But really, I never thought about it. And it's, now you ask the question, and this is the only answer I can, I can, I can think of. Good place to stop. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> do you have um, Do you have uh, pictures of your parents? Yes. Yes, I do. Can you make some copies of them? Definitely. And I talked about them. We should. Be Definitely. Yeah. Them. Oh, you have. You can give you an album with different things. Okay. You make. You make the choice. Felix. I think we have enough for today, chaps. Yeah. Yep. How was it, this one, for you? How was it for you? I don't know. <laughs> no, talking about things like that, I really don't know. I, uh, because that's quite personal. That's why. Because some people they can say, oh, he's trying, you know, to, 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 to stay clean. <laughs> no, it's not like this. It's because really, I mean, that's why I always believe in more in, than in respect than in love. To respect is very, very important. See, if you start with by respect and by being objective, things like that, you make a better society. Love, it's, uh, it's you start passion, you start things, and you express yourself in a different way because each one loves in a different way, and it's a chaos, right? But objectivity and respect, it's not, it's, uh, they're much more accurate things for survival. Do you agree? I'm just thinking you're getting very dangerously into Christian territory here. Ah, uh, because I, 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 I talk about <laughs> against love. No, 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 you didn't talk against love. I mean, that was a very interesting uh, distinction between the two, I think. Yeah, because, I mean, love became a marketing thing, which I don't think anybody means anything. Oh, I did this because I love you, or oh, I did this because of love and things like that, and it's disastrous. Out of respect, nobody harm anybody. Out of love, they kill people. True or not? Yeah. But it sounds good when you say love. It sounds interesting. It's selling. It's a hit. Respect sounds a little bit uh, too serious, too, too cold, too, you know. And to respect, you must have many, many reasons to love it's a, a quite personal thing. I'm not against that. And we, we all love. We all been in love. We, we all. I mean, nothing, nothing against this. But um, you don't build a society with love. It's easier you build with with respect. 
and this is uh, something that we can we can put on on, on, on how you call it uh, an experiment to have a town with respect and town with love and see what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting idea. Interesting idea, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. you could say, as you said, we were talking earlier, I mean, if you have uh, a society that uh, loves in a Christian sense, you finish up burning the books and burning people exactly. and so on. But if you respect, you don't. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's Columbus, isn't it? I mean, Columbus and the priests he took. Oh, yes, we love all the natives, etc., etc. Oh, yes, we do. Respect is different. <laughs> of course. If they respect the course. people they came across. Yeah. Which they never, they never respected. They, they at the contrary. Yeah, that, that's my point. Yeah, at the contrary, they just you know uh, completely destroy them in ev- every sense. Destruction and destruction. And then it's another thing which comes. It's it's, it's incredible. It's the um, what are you taking it? No, no, it's the eating. I was no, I'm eating. Oh, all the time. It's eating. It's terrible. Is the pardon? Sorry, is the the pardon? Well, when you know, because that gives you the opportunity to be an asshole, and then because you go and you know, uh, you give uh, absolution, things like that, you think you are okay, and you continue to be an asshole. <laughs> That's great. It's a very good device for, for 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 you know manipulating people, and you have to pay something. Of course. It's nothing for nothing for nothing, of course. How, how is possible, I mean, you know, to, to, to be an asshole and say, I'm sorry, I, I've been really terrible, what I can do? And I will do this and I will do that. And then say, okay, I, I pardon you. Okay, you have to sign here and, you know, you pay something and you are okay. You are, you, I mean, even, even a monkey will understand that this is, this is ridiculous. I'm not against the monkeys, actually. They're, they're great creatures. But, you know. <laughs> well, things like that we shouldn't say. Anything we didn't cover? Well, I'm sure we'll think of it at some point. That's what I can see here. You taking it? No. Yeah. You take it. You do. Oh, that's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Look, what the light can do. It's a beautiful picture, actually. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. You want a candy? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't need a candy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you again. Uh, got some very interesting, interesting, mm. I think we have some very interesting <laughs> But, you know, what I've said, it's, it's exactly, I can't go to details, which actually the sound ridiculous. But the bottom line is this bottom line of my family is this that uh, they've been wonderful and as the years go by you think you think and you see it in a different way and you discover how how good they they used to be Now you put me in, 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 in a memory <laughs> situation. Now I remember and I remember all the time my my childhood. Yeah. Incredible. But you weren't surprised then when later in life people did you know, I'm thinking of one thing in particular, which I don't I mean there's no point in, in discussing it. Um but the, I mean, there's one occasion, as you well know, where, where something really terrible happened to you professionally and financially. And I mean, were you prepared for that? I mean, did your, had your childhood prepared you for that? Or did that come as a sort of big emotional 
Which one are you in? Psychological shock. I forget, you told me once that there was some agent or manager oh, of the Oh, well, it's, or, it's better not to talk about no, it. No, no, uh, but I mean, yeah. I, I, mean I, I only remember it because you, you had told me about it, but um, my point is a, is a rather f more fundamental job. I mean, was that, that, did that surprise you or did that not fit into the pattern of your... No, it surprised me because it never fitted to the pattern. Well, you know, always surprised me when, when at the beginning. Now I'm not surprised anymore. Although, you know, uh, you know, I never, I never, you know, happy when things like this happen. Something, you know, unjust thing happened. But uh, the first one that really, really um, got me, and I was really, really very, very very sad about it, is when uh, at school later, I was about uh, around 15, 16 years of age, and uh, every year we used to to organize, the school of course, organize uh, art exhibition, paintings. And of course, you know, for me, it was uh, obvious that, you know, it was exhibit a few of my paintings at the time. And uh, at the previous years I got the first prize in school, of course. I mean I exhibit there as as a you know as a as a pupil. I mean <laughs> later I didn't want to exhibit. But there it was different. And uh, I remember that year something extraordinary happened. I went to the to the room to this place that everybody exhibits, all, all the you know the school I mean, you know, pupils, how you call them, yeah. Mm -hmm. They exhibit their own things and mine as well. And mine disappeared. Somebody stole stolen my paintings. I never found one who. But I was devastated. And I couldn't believe that someone is able to do such a thing. I mean, even now I'm saying that and I can't believe that somebody was... He did that. At the age of not more than 16, maybe. 15, 16 years, I can't remember. It's gone empty places. You could see the nail, but not, not the picture. And a part of you that had been stolen. Hmm? And a part of you that had been stolen, in effect. Me, only me. Yeah, but a part of you, your painting being a part of you, uh, is yeah, that yeah. that had been taken. Yes, the only paintings that are missing. I never found who did it. I never. But really, that, that really, I mean, marked, marked my my life. I mean, I couldn't believe that somebody is possible, is possible, is able actually to do such a thing. You know. Now, I said that because you said about things, how I take it when, when yeah. something happened. Well, something very, very important happened there, which I will never forget. Are you okay? Fine. Running. Yes, yes. Uh, you ask me if uh, I feel embarrassed. It's maybe uh, embarrassed is not the right word. It's maybe uneasy because there's nothing to be embarrassed. For. But um, I, I feel uneasy. Like I feel uneasy now. Always I feel uneasy when I'm, I have to talk to about myself. Um, when I talk about other things, it's okay, but uh, something that uh, questions that uh, have to do with my life, my career, things like that, that makes me uneasy. I don't know why, but this is it. This is the way I am. Again, picking up with what you said earlier, 
yeah. do, do talk about it because I think it is very interesting. I mean, um, we live in a celebrity age, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. I would want to say for worse, I think you think for worse too. Nonetheless, this is what people expect record companies, television companies demand. Mm. Um, one tries to steer a very narrow line to avoid it becoming mm. a kind of self-promotional exercise, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Yeah. Nonetheless, I mean, I can see the dangers and I can see the, the, the hesitancy about it. Um, it's, not a, it's not an easy balance to find. Yeah. Well, the celebrity age, you said, uh, what serves? Serves maybe the the media, the papers, the television, and maybe the person that is a celebrity. But in this case, uh, what when it comes to me, I don't feel very, I, I feel uneasy. And uh, and you you may ask me why I'm doing what I'm doing. Well, uh, the, the answer is maybe I can still do what I'm doing, but uh, just not to be part of the celebrity game. I mean, it, it works very well with me to be out of that circle. Yes, I mean, I don't, I don't remember ever having seen an interview with you, yeah, other, than, yeah. other than, you know, hello or about a particular... Okay. Very, very rare, and the interviews that I gave through the years is maybe just to make the point that I'm not dead. <laughs> I'm alive, because, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm just, hardly people can see me, and then, the, and I'm asking the same question, why, why I'm doing this, what I'm doing now? Yeah, maybe because some, somehow I, I felt that maybe I'd, I have to do a little bit. <laughs> oh, you know. What else? Tell me. Uh, but I, I can't continue that because it's uh, it's making me feel uneasy. Ah, <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, no, but uh, I mean that does go back to the the question which we haven't played you yet, but which is upstairs, yeah. which I did ask you before. You know, I'm curious. I really am curious to know. Um, let's forget what you said before, if, um, but I am curious to know how you, how you perceive yourself and how you want other people to perceive you, which is not always the same thing. Well, I perceive myself, you know, as I always did. Nothing changed since day one, from day one, since I remember myself. And as I told you before, I never knew that that, uh, you know, I'm going to go through all this, uh, you know, uh, let's say, musical career success you know, and all that. Something that, uh, you know, I wasn't aware at the time. So nothing changed, I mean, basically nothing changed for me. Now, for the others, you know, I found out that when um, a success comes and when you know, an award comes, I feel that people around me, they are much more happy than me. No, nothing changed for me. You see, it's more important uh, for me to, uh, to be useful and to, uh, to have things to do than to, to become famous. I was you can have sometimes, you know, for the right or the wrong reasons. Always you have to question why you are famous. I don't think people question themselves why they're famous. And uh, sometimes the reasons are they're not the right reasons why. But today, as long as you're famous, that's very, very important. It's, you know, the goal, if you want. For me, not. Never, it's never been that. So, but I see the happiness around me and the joy and the people, you know, my friends and my, you know, the people that they, you know, they're close to me. And, um, you know, they, they always enjoy and they're very happy. Oh, yes, great, and you've done that. 
and basically nothing changed. You know, for me, nothing changed. I, I never, I never become and I became better because I've been awarded. I'm better because I've done something maybe better than before, or just uh, I went deeper to to solve a problem, or maybe to to create something, whatever it is. But you never become better because you've been awarded and decorated. The, the, the deep, deep inside, nothing, nothing changed. The relation, your relations with, with with the people around you change, but not you. Or, if it's any change, for that reason, because you've been awarded, then I think the change won't be a good one. Why do you think you're famous then? What? Sorry? You, you, you said most people don't ask themselves why, why they're famous. Why do you think you're famous? Well, because you are, as you know. Because it happened that, you know, during my uh, musical career, uh, it happened to sell uh, uh, quite a lot of records and people bought, you know, the music that I compose and then and they liked it, and then, you know, it's obvious that uh, I will become known. Your friends are incredibly protective about you. I mean, I don't know many of them, but those that I know, I mean, they, the, it's not that they say things behind your back. Yeah. They wouldn't. Yeah. But that's not that kind of protectiveness, but you, you, you sense that there's a kind of family uh, in which it's almost... In, I mean, I, if I may say so, I think I've been marginally included in mm. the family of late. But you sense that this family is sort of like a protective shield around you in the, in the best sense. Which well, is why I think when a, when a, when a business executive comes mm. to you, or I mean a record executive comes to you, or a, a journalist comes to you, mm. it's not that you're unfriendly towards them, because mm. you're not, but, but that somehow that, that sort of um, uh, mm. uh, protective shield is prevents them getting close, if you see what I mean. In, 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 in yeah, yeah. Sense, I, don't think, I don't think you do that in a destructive way at all. No, no, I understand. Maybe because they know how I am. They know that I'm not... I never play the, the, the show business game, and uh, they know, I mean, they... Uh, of course, they like very much uh, the success, but at the, at the same time, they know that uh, by not playing this game, uh, I would be very unhappy if uh, if they go against that. That this this the way that I feel. So um, I don't know, of course, because when they are protect protective, I'm not in the front to see how they they behave. Well, they never, they, give you an example. They never talk about you. Hmm. If you see what I mean, I mean maybe because maybe because they 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 know that I never talk about me, so uh, I mean even now that I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about me, but but in a sense that I say I'm not, I don't like to talk about me, so maybe that's why they do the same. I presume, I don't know. Yes, one never hears one never hears gossip about you. If you see what I mean, it's, no, it's, because I, I I believe that my personal life has nothing to do with the, the rest of the world, and it's not because I'm only only private. Because I believe that people they have so many problems, and in one hand, of course, they like to uh, to read the gossip papers because everybody does. It's an escapism, but I think it is it's, it's a little, little bit too much to add. To that, your personal life. So I try to limit the things that uh, I'm exposed, and this is one of the reasons that I kept painting, you know, uh, separate. Because I didn't want to, you know, I, let's say that I wanted to keep something uh, private. Because you remind me very much of uh, you have absolutely in common with it. Other friend of mine, sadly dead now, Stanley Kubrick. I mean, Stanley Kubrick was, all, as you know, was always thought of as being very reclusive, very difficult to get to, very difficult to talk to. 
I thought he was one of the most gregarious and generous mm. people I've ever met. You're exactly the same. Yeah. Um, um, here <laughs> around this table. I mean, it's, as it were, non-stop party time. Your reputation, however, some, insofar as it, it, uh, has, uh, it can be defined, is of someone who's very uh, reclusive and doesn't speak. Oh, well, does it, no, does no, what I mean? no, I mean, exactly. Yeah, but this is the easy, easy way to say things. I mean, uh, what I'm trying to say is that I'm not the person that, you know, it's moody and I don't want to talk to anybody, it's very difficult and very tempered. Not at all, at the contrary. But this is something that doesn't concern anybody else. It concerns myself and the people around me. Who wants to be around? I mean, I don't want to impose my life to any anybody. It's it's a job to impose your life to you know to 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 to, to people because this is the way that the whole business has been run for years, for the right or wrong reasons. I don't know, but it, I don't. I'm not part of that, and I'm not against anybody that wants to do this. But I don't feel like doing it. I don't have to have the time to do that. Oop! Disaster strikes. I see. That's it. I would like to keep my balance like this thing here. As long as, long as you do that, you see? Balance, speed, look, harmony. That's it. Beautiful. Go on. Longevity. Great, look at it. Hmm. Come on. Finally. Excellent. Finally. No, you, I know. I you've mean, been saying. It's, but it is, it's a very unusual. It must, it does, not must, it does require an awful lot of discipline, self discipline to make sure that those areas which you want to keep to yourself are kept to yourself. So anything like this is an imposition. Mm -hmm. Well, aware uh, of it. I mean, I'm somebody, once somebody said to me, that you always say no. I said, I, I, I don't say no. I don't say easily yes to unnecessary things. That's a quite a different thing. Because you have the negative people, whatever you said, say no, no, no. But not, not to say easily yes, that's another, another way of thinking. And another another way of uh, living. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> you know, for years people have been saying that uh, I don't like to fly. For example, you know, it's been in every paper, and I have so many <laughs> bits of films myself in a plane, in a cockpit. You know, laughing and, and you know, <laughs> and uh, joking and all that, so. I mean, if you want to know anything, just ask me. You don't believe what, what, is, what people say and write. <laughs> yeah. I think we should take a separate shot of the close-up of it. Do you want a shot? Yeah. Okay, go shot. That's the one. Okay, I think we covered the two bits that we wanted to cover. We did. Uh, 
Okay. Let me see if one of those. Okay, it's too quick. Yeah, it's too bad. No, I mean, we went back over the two questions that uh, mm -hmm. you were concerned about before. Your parents and they, how you saw yourself. Yeah, I didn't want to say much, just just, no, no, just, no, 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 no. just a little bit. No, my, my point is that we covered the two things yeah, that you yeah. wanted to, to cover. Anything else to cover? Uh, what else we can cover? Oh, I don't know. You haven't talked about particular projects at all. Um, I mean, I've got the making of Methodia, so I'm covered there. We see you working with Ridley. Mm. I don't know if there's any other particular project that you want to. What are we going to say? I don't know if you want to talk about Oliver politely. Say <laughs> what? But I did. I did. Yes, you did. No, you did. You did. I did. I did. Um, I did. Uh, well, uh, ask the question and I see. Not, not particularly about projects. About projects. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, for, for us from the outside, or for me from the outside, you, you have a, um, a completely spontaneous way of approaching a. Um, of answering a project, of dealing with a project. I mean, it seems to be absolutely instinctive and absolutely spontaneous. And I'm sure that's what gives it its special quality. That must be a, a nightmare for, um, you know, what film producers, I mean, producers are like the David Putnams of this world. They're not good at dealing with spontaneity. Hmm. Look, to me, uh, you have to, we have to define what we call a project. I mean, to me, everything that I'm doing is a project. A project is not only when we frame something with, uh, and we call it, uh, you know, uh, an album, as we call it, or we call it, uh, you know, a soundtrack or ballet or music for a play. I mean, th this we call project. For me, everything I, I do is a project, and I don't need a, a record company's contract in order to to record something, and I don't need a, a film in order to to create uh, music or a piece of music. I, I do it anyway. And I find out that the period that I was out of a, of a contract, I worked really in a much better way. Now, as I do that, you know, since day one again, uh, it's not something uh, strange or unusual for me uh, to work uh, every day or almost every day without uh, thinking that this is for that particular project of an, or another project. Same thing with painting. I paint all my years and never thought to exhibit. Normally people, they, they prepare the exhibition or a uh, singer uh, prepares uh, the, his new album or, uh, you know, it happens like that in, in this business. With me, no. It happens every day. Uh, even if I don't have any, let's call it commission, that comes from, from outside. Usually my commissions, they come from above. <laughs> let's call it that way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm always plugged there and you know any time night or day I'm 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 just uh, operating as I said before I'm available but um, at the other hand when I'm committed to something when I say yes um, I will stay until the end in a quite professional way. Because that's a different thing. Because you're committed, you work with other people, and uh, you have to take uh, the part of the responsibility that has been given to you. Uh, but other than that, I like to work 
any moment, any time, anywhere, without thinking that this is a particular project or a particular commission, because this is the way that I function. Do you have any regrets about things? That, I mean, not not particular projects, but I mean, you, you seem once one yeah just peeks inside the door mm -hmm. of your family. Yeah. You know, you seem a wonderfully. If I say contented, that sounds like complacent. I don't mean complacent. I mean contented, at peace yeah. with yourself. And well, I mean, regrets of something or. Well, yes, no, I wasn't thinking of any particular project. I mean, I just, it's, it's, it's very rare to meet someone who is as successful as you are. He doesn't really want to know about that success, except registering it on the scale, as it were. But also, at the same time, is very, very content, and I don't mean by that complacent. I mean, at peace with himself and his immediate environment. Well, I, I can't say that I'm, I'm content with my career, what we call career, because let's face it, I mean, it's, nothing is easy. And uh, it's not a question easy to be successful, not being successful. It's to, to deal with, uh, with, uh, with this, the you know, music business. Already music business is, is a term which holds a lot of problem, business. <laughs> So, um, and uh, although, uh, I, I will, that, although I tried very hard to keep a part of freedom and to do certain things and not, and not to repeat myself within this frame, never, you know, uh, nevertheless is a frame and, 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 and that frame can squeeze you because more successful you become, uh, the tighter becomes because the, you, you, they, they um, push you somehow to uh, to stay the same and to, to produce the same su successful past. And this is something that I found it very difficult to deal. And uh, I'm not very happy with my career, if you want. Uh, because I had many other things to, to, to propose and to, to release, but I've been always restrict, restricted to certain things because of the success, because of the sales. So, um, and you know, everything in life you have to be in boxes. I mean, at the beginning when I, I start to, to make my first albums, which you know, they started completely against the against the flow of the, of the time. The record shops, they didn't know where to put my album, in which box, because you know that they have boxes. Then gradually, when I passed the fourth or fifth album, then I had my own box. <laughs> it's a Vangelis, and then you had the whole. And then, you know, when, when I started with uh, with the the uh, film scores, that was difficult because that goes to another box. So you had uh, movies, Vangelis, uh, you know, Vangelis as, as Vangelis, and then you had, uh, you know, we had New Age, then uh, immediately they find out that the, the, the <laughs> albums that I was making, all oh, they belong to the New Age. I mean, this is, you know, the marketing titles that, you know, some very clever people, they always, you know, invent in order to frame the whole thing. So you had New Age, you had film scores, you had Vangelis and whatever, I don't know what. And then, you know, I end up being, you know, in different boxes again, but always boxes. And I, I always, I was trying, <clears throat> although, you know, the boxes multiply, I was trying to get out of the boxes. And maybe just to create <laughs> another box, you know what I mean? And, and, and that, that was, you know, the, 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 the big problem, you know, with, with my career. And still, if you ask me today, I believe that I've done nothing except a few successful albums. But this, compared to what I, 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 I record every day, this is nothing. Without saying, I'm not saying that what I've done is bad, uh, what I, I didn't release is good. What I'm saying is that that there are things quite different. 
in my uh, one of the, of the very difficult moments during you know few uh, interviews that I gave in my life and uh, some people that they ask me what is your latest work or when I, when I release an, an album say oh I, I love your latest latest work and uh, to me this latest work it's really so old because since then I maybe I compose another 20 or 30 like that like new works I'm doing I'm saying then Although I have to play the game saying thank you very much and this is the latest, this is not the latest. Because usually when, when, when you have a new album of a singer and uh, the heavy promotion is going behind, it is really, literally, the latest work. But for me, when is the latest work? I don't know. Before before this conversation, I compose something, and after this conversation, I will compose something else. What is my latest? <laughs> the next one, and maybe tomorrow another one. So I had to deal with all these kind of um, preconceived things, ideas, I like the idea of an album, or the idea of a, of a single, or a group, or all that, because there are devices that help the business in order to uh, to to promote and to uh, to sell what they call the product, and it's very very difficult uh, to get used to this idea. The moment that you start in a completely different way, a market doesn't exist, an album doesn't exist, a single doesn't exist. You know, just music, and the motivation to make the music is completely different. Because what is the motivation to make an album today? We make a group, we make an album, we make a promotion, we make money. Clean, clear, right? And everybody is happy. I hope <laughs> happy, <laughs> but. With me, it never happened like that, although I went through this game. But it was not my game. And again, you know, if you ask me why I've done that, it's because I didn't have any other choice to, uh, to support all the things I wanted to do. All the demands that the sound, the, the sound is the most uh, demanding thing. The music is the most demanding thing. Up, absolutely. I mean, it's in one hand is fulfilling and fascinating, and the other thing is crush you down because it wants the music wants you. And especially in my case, I wanted all this incredible uh, equipment because I'm working in a quite electronic way. Acoustic and electronic, of course, but then, then you have to build all that. And if you don't have, you know, then at the time to have your own studio was a big thing. Today, of course, technology allows you to have, even with, with one laptop, people that can do something. I mean, they call it single, or they call it production, they call it album, or whatever. Uh, then you had, you had to have a, a proper studio, a big studio, which I did. And I still do, everywhere in the world. I go and just build something. And I carry all the equipment with me, and I have other equipment, you know, in London, in Paris, in Athens, and, you know, I find out myself in Los Angeles, <laughs> you know, having a studio in my place, you know, in, in New York, in my hotel, in, in Rome, I made an album in a hotel. Always have, you know, tons and tons of things. So all that costs money. And I have to take care of those kind of things, because nobody will pay for that, except myself, and I'm proud for that. Because then I keep my independence and my dignity. That's another spin. OK? Mm -hmm. That's a spin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
It was a kind of throwaway line, but it's such an important idea. I, I want to not quite throw it away. And when you said music makes a demand, makes is a is a demanding mistress. You didn't use that phrase, but I mean you may say well, like I can say it makes yes. demands. Yeah. Well, what do you mean by that? Try to be at the level and the importance of music, and and. Uh, once that you you realize what music means and 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 you respect that, immediately it becomes very demanding. The music is not a joke. It's a very serious thing. Serious thing doesn't mean serious in a way you know serious. You can laugh. I mean you can. But um, you have to be always there. You have to be ready. You have to. I mean. I spend hours and hours and hours with all this system, my system, all, all that that I create around. It needs a lot of practice. I play hours. These fingers they've done, you know, miles and miles every day. And it's not only that; it's the connection between my brain, my fingers, my my whole body. It's uh, I work like an athlete. It doesn't come, you know, in that sense easy. Because all that should come through the body, which is another machine, and you have to 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 um, develop the technique in order to the most difficult thing to appear very easy, not to appear to others, mm -hmm. but to be able to obtain the immediate result. And many, I mean, all the you know musicians. Uh, that they, especially the soloists and all that, they, they will understand that because they spend hours practicing. So, in one hand, of course, I'm spontaneous, in the other hand, I practice a lot. Every day in my life. Night and day. I don't want to sound bore, boring, but, but, you know, you can't do without sp spending, you know, more than, I mean, three quarters of your life in order to, to, to come to the standard, to reach, to go as close as possible to music. That's why I'm saying it's very demanding. And then, of course, the wonder of music, the vastness, the possibilities of music, the power of music, something that is so amazing and beautiful can sometimes, you know, uh, tire you and can, can drive you crazy as much as something that is not. Music works both ways. See, oh, he says, that's so beautiful, I can't stand that, that beauty anymore. That happened to you to say that, no? To everybody. So when you live with, with something, with this, with music, and with painting, of course, because when you are in, in front of something empty, there are two ways. Or you leave, you leave it empty and then you ask a, a lot of money for the, for the emptiness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you invade this emptiness either with something that worth the, the trouble to do it, or with uh, nonsense. But the, the question is there, what are you going to do? And it's not, nobody, nobody puts you in that situation, you put yourself in that situation. Now, why you do that? That's another discussion, maybe another moment, but the thing is that it happens. So all these things are very demanding. The people that take only the, the successful part, the success, the awards, the sales, the, you know, the decorations and all that, and bravos, and all that is a very tiny moment, which most of the times, you know, creates you more problems than other things. But the real struggle is what you, you don't see. How many times have I spent sitting there and and. Uh, playing, and I learn every day more and more, more and more, because sometimes when I, I do things that I don't understand how I did it. 
then I have to go back and say, okay, how did this? Because mo most of the times I'm not there when, when that happens. I'm there, but I'm not there. So I have to go back, and the, most of the times when I listen to the music much later, in order to keep the distance and to be as ob objective as possible, then I realize that there are things that, are, that don't know how they happen. That's very, I mean, to me it's fascinating sometimes. And all that has nothing to do with, with uh, releasing music, uh, with success. This, this is a different thing. I'm, I'm not saying that referring to, to, um, to okay, how I said that to, in order to value anything, to say that what I'm doing is, is fantastic. No, no, it's nothing to do with that. It's just, I try to, to tell you how, how it happens and what happened. Impossible to put into words, really. Impossible to put into words. That's why you have the music. <laughs> and again, when you try to, you know, to explain, <coughs> sorry, uh, scientifically, maybe it's possible to explain to to certain extent, and then you have to enter to the philosophical fields. But science, of course, in science, you can. Uh, with science, you can explain a lot of things. Why? Do you find it a very lonely business then? Um, no, forget business. I didn't mean the word business. Lonely pursuit. <laughs> lonely. Again, loneliness is uh, uh, how you how you receive it, how how you you accept it. Maybe what's loneliness for you is not loneliness for me, and uh, but it's not necessary when you are alone that you are lonely. You find out, I know many people, they say that when they are with other people they are more lonely than when they are alone. When you are with music, you're not alone. I mean, I've never been alone with music. But... Uh, Loneliness can come for other things. Society can create a lot of loneliness, more and more. And we have to be prepared for that, how to deal, to, f to have little psychological devices in order to to prevent or to <laughs> to accept the loneliness. Prevent, actually, no, prevent, prevent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we can stop now. <laughs>